Chapter One of A Tangled Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter One. To my pupil. Beloved pupil, tamed by thee, addish, subtract, multiplication, division, fractions, rule of three, attest thy deft manipulation. Then onward, let the voice of fame from age to age repeat thy story, till thou hast won thyself a name exceeding even Euclid's glory. Preface this tale originally appeared as a serial in the monthly packet beginning in april eighteen eighty the writer's intention was to embody in each knot like the medicine so dexterously but ineffectually concealed in the jam of our early childhood one or more mathematical questions in arithmetic algebra or geometry as the case might be for the amusement and possible edification of the fair readers of that magazine Lewis Carroll, October 1885. A Tangled Tale, Not One, Excelsior. Goblin, lead them up and down. The ruddy glow of sunset was already fading into the somber shadows of night, when two travelers might have been observed swiftly, at a pace of six miles in the hour, descending the rugged side of a mountain the younger bounding from crag to crag with the agility of a fawn, while his companion, whose aged limbs seemed ill at ease in the heavy chain armor habitually worn by tourists in that district, toiled on painfully at his side. As is always the case under such circumstances, the younger knight was the first to break the silence. "'A goodly pace, I trow!' he exclaimed. "'We sped not thus in the ascent!' "'Goodly indeed!' the other echoed with a groan. We clung bit but at three miles in the hour. And on the dead level our pace is... Um, the younger suggested, for he was weak in statistics and left all such details to his aged companion. Four miles in the hour, the other wearily replied. Not an ounce more, he added, with that love of metaphor so common in old age, and not a farthing less. "'Twas three hours past high noon when we left our hostelry," the young man said, musingly. "'We shall scarce be back by supper-time. Perchance mine host will roundly deny us all food. "'He will chide our tardy return,' was the grave reply, "'and such a rebuke will be meet.' "'A brave conceit!' cried the other with a merry laugh. "'And should we bid him bring us yet another course, I trow his answer will be tart.' We shall but get our deserts, sighed the elder knight, who had never seen a joke in his life, and was somewhat displeased at his companion's untimely levity. It will be nine of the clock, he added in an undertone, by the time we regain our hostelry. Full many a mile shall we have plodded this day. How many? How many? cried the eager youth, ever athirst for knowledge. The old man was silent. Tell me, he answered after a moment's thought what time it was when we stood together on yonder peak not exact to the minute he added hastily reading a protest in the young man's face and i guess be within one poor half hour of the mark tis all i ask of thy mother's son then will i tell thee true to the last inch how far we shall have trudged betwixt three and nine of the clock a groan was the young man's only reply, while his convulsed features and the deep wrinkles that chased each other across his manly brow revealed the abyss of arithmetical agony into which one chance question had plunged him. End of chapter 1Recording by Avai in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 2. Not 2. Eligible Apartments. Straight down the crooked lane and all round the square. Let's ask Balbus about it, said Hugh. All right, said Lambert. 
He can guess it, said Hugh. Rather, said Lambert. No more words were needed. The two brothers understood each other perfectly. Balbus was waiting for them at the hotel. The journey down had tired him, he said. So his two pupils had been the round of the place, in search of lodgings, without the old tutor, who had been their inseparable companion from their childhood. They had named him after the hero of their Latin exercise book, which overflowed with anecdotes of that versatile genius, anecdotes whose vagueness in detail was more than compensated by the sensational brilliance. Balbus has overcome all his enemies, had been marked by their tutor in the margin of the book, successful bravery. In this way he had tried to extract a moral from every anecdote about Balbus, sometimes one of warning, as in, Balbus had borrowed a healthy dragon, against which he had written, rashness in speculation, sometimes of encouragement, as in the words, influence of sympathy in united action which stood opposite to the anecdote, Balbus was assisting his mother-in-law to convince the dragon. And sometimes it dwindled down to a single word, such as prudence, which was all he could extract from the touching record that Balbus, having scorched the tail of the dragon, went away. His pupils liked the short morals best, as it left them more room for marginal illustrations, and in this instance they required all the space they could get to exhibit the rapidity of the hero's departure. Their report of the state of things was discouraging. That most fashionable of watering places, Little Mendip, was chock full, as the boys expressed it, from end to end. But in one square they had seen no less than four cards in different houses, all announcing in flaming capitals, eligible apartments. So there's plenty of choice after all, you see, said spokesman Hugh in conclusion. That doesn't follow from the data said Balbus, as he rose from the easy chair where he had been dozing over the little Mendip Gazette. They may be all single rooms. However, we may as well see them. I shall be glad to stretch my legs a bit. An unprejudiced bystander might have objected that the operation was needless, and that this long, lank creature would have been all the better with even shorter legs, but no such thought occurred to his loving pupils. One on each side, they did their best to keep up with his gigantic strides, while Hugh repeated the sentence in their father's letter, just received from abroad, over which he and Lambert had been puzzling. He says a friend of his, the governor of... What was that name again, Lambert? Kogovchny, said Lambert. Well, yes, the governor of... what you may call it, wants to give a very small dinner party and he means to ask his father's brother-in-law, his brother's father-in-law, his father-in-law's brother, and his brother-in-law's father, and we're to guess how many guests there will be. There was an anxious pause. How large did he say the pudding was to be? Balbus said at last. Take its cubical contents, divide by the cubical contents of what each man can eat, and the quotient... He didn't say anything about pudding, said Hugh. And here's the square, as they turned a corner and came into sight of the eligible apartments. It is a square, was Balbus's first cry of delight as he gazed around him. Beautiful, beautiful, equilateral and rectangular. The boys looked round with less enthusiasm. Number nine is the first with a card, said prosaic Lambert, but Balbus would not so soon awake from his dream of beauty. See, boys, he cried, twenty doors on a side, what symmetry! Each side divided into twenty-one equal parts. It's delicious. Shall I knock or ring? said Hugh, looking in some perplexity at a square brass plate which bore the simple inscription, Ring also. Both, said Balbus. That's an ellipsis, my boy. Did you never see an ellipsis before? I couldn't hardly read it, said Hugh evasively. It's no good having an ellipsis if they don't keep it clean. Which there is one room, gentlemen, said the smiling landlady, and a sweet room too, a snug little back room. We will see it, said Balbus gloomily as they followed her in. I knew how it would be. One room in each house. No view, I suppose. 
which indeed there is gentlemen the landlady indignantly protested as she drew up the blind and indicated the back garden cabbages i perceive said balbus well they're green at any rate which the greens at the shops their hostess explained are by no means dependable upon here you has them on the premises end of the best does the window open was always balbus first question in testing a lodging and does the chimney smoke his second satisfied on all points he secured the refusal of the room and they moved on to number twenty five this landlady was grave and stern i've no but one room left she told them and it gives on the back garden but there are cabbages balbus suggested the landlady visibly relented there is sir she said and good ones though i say it as shouldn't we can't rely on the shops for greens so we grows them ourselves a singular advantage said balbus and after the usual questions they went on to fifty two and i'd gladly accommodate you all if i could was the greeting that met them we are but mortal irrelevant muttered balbus and i've let all my rooms but one which one is the back room i perceive said balbus and looking out on on cabbages i presume yes indeed sir said their hostess whatever other folks may do we grows our own for the shops an excellent arrangement balbus interrupted then one can really depend on their being good does the window open the usual questions were answered satisfactorily but this time you added one of his own invention does the cat scratch the landlady looked round suspiciously as if to make sure the cat was not listening i will not deceive you gentlemen she said it do scratch but not without you pulls its whiskers it'll never do it she repeated slowly with a visible effort to recall the exact words of some written agreement between herself and the cat without you pulls its whiskers much may be excused in a cat so treated said balbus as they left the house and crossed to number seventy three leaving the landlady curtsying on the doorstep and still murmuring to herself her parting words as if they were a form of blessing not without you pulls its whiskers at number seventy three they found only a small shy girl to show the house who said yes m in answer to all questions the usual room said balbus as they marched in the usual back garden the usual cabbages i suppose you can't get them good at the shops yes m said the girl well you may tell your mistress we will take the room and that her plan of growing her own cabbages is simply admirable yes m said the girl as she showed them out one day room and three bedrooms said balbus as they returned to the hotel we will take as our day room the one that gives us the least walking to do to get to it must we walk from door to door and count the steps said lambert no no figure it out my boys figure it out balbus gaily exclaimed as he put pens ink and paper before his hapless pupils and left the room i say it'll be a job said hugh rather said lambert End of chapter 2well they call me so because i am a little mad i suppose she said good-humouredly in answer to clara's cautiously worded question as to how she came by so strange a nickname you see i never do what sane people are expected to do nowadays i never wear long trains talking of trains that's the charing cross metropolitan station i've something to tell you about that and i never play lawn tennis i can't cook an omelette i can't even set a broken limb there's an ignamorous for you clara was her niece and full twenty years her junior in fact she was still attending a high school 
an institution of which mad Mathesis spoke with undisguised aversion. Let a woman be meek and lowly, she would say. None of your high schools for me. But it was vacation time just now, and Clara was her guest, and Mad Mathesis was showing her the sights of that eighth wonder of the world, London. The Charing Cross Metropolitan Station, she resumed, waving her hand towards the entrance as if she were introducing her niece to a friend. The Bayswater and Birmingham extension is just completed, and the trains now run round and round continuously, skirting the border of Wales, just touching at York, and so round by the east coast back to London. The way the trains run is most peculiar. The westerly ones go round in two hours, the easterly ones take three, but they always manage to start two trains from here, opposite ways, punctually every quarter of an hour. They part to meet again, said Clara, her eyes filling with tears at the romantic thought. No need to cry about it, her aunt grimly remarked. They don't meet on the same line of rails, you know. Talking of meeting, an idea strikes me, she added, changing the subject with her usual abruptness. Let's go opposite ways round and see which can meet most trains. No need for a chaperon, ladies' saloon, you know. You shall go whichever way you like, and we'll have a bet about it. I never make bets, Clara said very gravely. Our excellent preceptress has often warned us. You'd be none the worse if you did, Mad Mathesis interrupted. In fact, you'd be the better, I'm certain. Neither does our excellent preceptress approve of puns, said Clara. But we'll have a match, if you like. Let me choose my train she added after a brief mental calculation, and I'll engage to meet exactly half as many again as you do. Not if you count fair, Mad Mathesis bluntly interrupted. Remember, we only count the trains we meet on the way. You mustn't count the one that starts as you start, nor the one that arrives as you arrive. That will only make the difference of one train, said Clara as they turned and entered the station. But I never travelled alone before. There'll be no one to help me to alight. However, I don't mind. Let's have a match. A ragged little boy overheard her remark and came running after her. Buy a box of cigar lights, miss, he pleaded, pulling her shawl to attract her attention. Clara stopped to explain. I never smoke cigars, she said in a meekly apologetic tone. Our excellent preceptress... But Mad Mathesis impatiently hurried her on, and the little boy was left gazing after her with round eyes of amazement. The two ladies bought their tickets and moved slowly down the central platform, Mad Mathesis prattling on as usual, Clara silent, anxiously reconsidering the calculation on which she rested her hopes of winning the match. "'Mind where you go, dear!' cried her aunt, checking her just in time. One step more and you have been in that pail of cold water. I know, I know, said Clara dreamily. The pail, the cold, and the moony. Take your places on the springboards, shouted the porter. What are they for? Clara asked in a terrified whisper. Merely to help us into the trains. The elder lady spoke with the nonchalance of one quite used to the process. Very few people can get into a carriage without help in less than three seconds, and the trains only stop for one second. At this moment the whistle was heard, and two trains rushed into the station. A moment's pause, and they were gone again. But in that brief interval several hundred passengers had been shot into them, each flying straight to his place with the accuracy of a mini-bullet, while an equal number were showered out upon the side platforms. Three hours had passed away, and the two friends met again on the Charing Cross platform, and eagerly compared notes. Then Clara turned away with a sigh. To young impulsive hearts like hers, disappointment is always a bitter pill. Mad Mathesis followed her, full of kindly sympathy. "'Try again, my love,' she said cheerily. "'Let us vary the experiment. "'We will start as we did before, but not to begin counting till our trains meet.' When we see each other, we will say, one, and so count on till we come here again. Clara brightened up. I shall win that, she exclaimed eagerly. 
if i may choose my train another shriek of engine whistles another upheaving of springboards another living avalanche plunging into two trains as they flashed by and the travellers were off again each gazed eagerly from her carriage window holding up her handkerchief as a signal to her friend a rush and a roar two trains shot past each other in the tunnel and two travellers leaned back in their corners with a sigh or rather with two sighs of relief one clara murmured to herself one it's a word of good omen this time at any rate the victory will be mine but was it End of chapter 3chapter four of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter four not four the dead reckoning i did dream of money bags to-night noonday on the open sea within a few degrees of the equator is apt to be oppressively warm and our two travellers were now airily clad in suits of dazzling white linen having laid aside the chain armour which they had found not only endurable in the cold mountain air they had lately been breathing but a necessary precaution against the daggers of the banditti who infested the heights their holiday trip was over and they were now on their way home in the monthly packet which plied between the two great ports of the island they had been exploring along with their armour the tourists had laid aside the antiquated speech it had pleased them to affect while in knightly disguise and had returned to the ordinary style of two country gentlemen of the twentieth century stretched on a pile of cushions under the shade of a huge umbrella they were lazily watching some native fishermen who had come on board at the last landing-place each carrying over his shoulder a small but heavy sack a large weighing machine that had been used for cargo at the last port stood on the deck and round this the fishermen had gathered and with much unintelligible jabber seemed to be weighing their sacks more like sparrows in a tree than human talk isn't it the elder tourist remarked to his son who smiled feebly but would not exert himself so far as to speak the old man tried another listener what have they got in those sacks captain he inquired as that great being passed them in his never-ending parade to and fro on the deck the captain paused in his march and towered over the travellers tall grave and serenely self-satisfied fishermen he explained are often passengers in my ship these five are from rooksy the place we last touched at and that's the way they carry their money the money of this island is heavy gentlemen but it costs little as you may guess we buy it from them by weight about five shillings a pound i fancy a ten pound note would buy all those sacks by this time the old man had closed his eyes in order no doubt to concentrate his thoughts on these interesting facts but the captain failed to realize his motive and with a grunt resumed his monotonous march meanwhile the fishermen were getting so noisy over the weighing machine that one of the sailors took the precaution of carrying off all the weights leaving them to amuse themselves with such substitutes in the form of winch handles belaying pins etc as they could find this brought their excitement to a speedy end they carefully hid their sacks in the folds of the jib that lay on the deck near the tourists and strolled away when next the captain's heavy footfall passed the younger man roused himself to speak what did you call the place those fellows came from captain he asked mruxi sir and the one we are bound for the captain took a long breath plunged into the word and came out of it nobly they call it Kogovjini, sir. K I give it up, the young man faintly said. He stretched out his hand for a glass of iced water, which the compassionate steward had brought him a minute ago, and had sat down, unluckily, just outside the shadow of the umbrella. It was scalding hot, and he decided not to drink it. 
the effort of making this resolution coming close on the fatiguing conversation he had just gone through was too much for him he sank back among the cushions in silence his father courteously tried to make amends for his nonchalance whereabouts are we now captain said he have you any idea the captain cast a pitying look on the ignorant landsman i could tell you that sir he said in a tone of lofty condescension to an inch you don't say so the old man remarked in a tone of languid surprise and mean so persisted the captain why what do you suppose would become of my ship if i were to lose my longitude and my latitude could you make anything of my dead reckoning nobody could i'm sure the other heartily rejoined but he had overdone it it's perfectly intelligible the captain said in an offended tone to any one that understands such things with these words he moved away and began giving orders to the men who were preparing to hoist the jib our tourists watched the operation with such interest that neither of them remembered the five money bags which in another moment as the wind filled out the jib were whirled overboard and fell heavily into the sea but the poor fishermen had not so easily forgotten their property in a moment they had rushed to the spot and stood uttering cries of fury and pointing now to the sea and now to the sailors who had caused the disaster the old man explained it to the captain let us make it up among us he added in conclusion ten pounds will do it i think you said but the captain put aside the suggestion with a wave of the hand no sir he said in his grandest manner you will excuse me i am sure but these are my passengers the accident has happened on board my ship and under my orders it is for me to make compensation he turned to the angry fisherman come here my man he said in the mruxian dialect tell me the weight of each sack i saw you weighing them just now then ensued a perfect babel of noise as the five natives explained all screaming together how the sailors had carried off the weights and they had done what they could with whatever came handy two iron belaying pins three blocks six holy stones four winch handles and a large hammer were now carefully weighed the captain superintending and noting the results but the matter did not seem to be settled even then an angry discussion followed in which the sailors and the five natives all joined and at last the captain approached our tourists with a disconcerted look which he tried to conceal under a laugh it's an absurd difficulty he said perhaps one of you gentlemen can suggest something it seems they weighed the sacks two at a time if they didn't have five separate weighings of course you can't value them separately the youth hastily decided let's hear all about it was the old man's more cautious remark they did have five separate weighings the captain said but well it beats me entirely he added in a sudden burst of candor here's the result first and second sack weighed twelve pounds second and third thirteen and a half third and fourth eleven and a half fourth and fifth eight and then they say they had only the large hammer left and it took three sacks to weigh it down that's the first third and fifth and they weighed sixteen pounds there gentlemen did you ever hear anything like that the old man muttered under his breath if only my sister were here and looked helplessly at his son his son looked at the five natives the five natives looked at the captain the captain looked at nobody his eyes were cast down and he seemed to be saying softly to himself contemplate one another gentlemen if such be your good pleasure i contemplate myself end of chapter four chapter five of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Hawaii in october two thousand nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter five not five oughts and crosses look here upon this picture and on this 
And what made you choose the first train, Goosey? said Matt Mathesis, as they got into the cab. Couldn't you count better than that? I took an extreme case, was the tearful reply. Our excellent perceptress always says, when in doubt, my dears, take an extreme case. And I was in doubt. Does it always succeed? her aunt inquired. Clara sighed. Not always, she reluctantly admitted. And I can't make out why. One day she was telling the little girls, they make such noise at tea, you know. The more noise you make, the less jam you will have, and vice versa. And I thought they wouldn't know what vice versa meant, so I explained it to them. I said, if you make an infinite noise, you'll get no jam, and if you make no noise, you'll get an infinite lot of jam. But our excellent preceptress said that wasn't a good instance. Why wasn't it? she added plaintively. Her aunt evaded the question. One sees certain objections to it, she said. But how did you work it with the metropolitan trains? None of them go infinitely fast, I believe. I call them hares and tortoises, Clara said, a little timidly, for she dreaded being laughed at. And I thought there couldn't be so many hares as tortoises on the line, so I took an extreme case, one hare and an infinite number of tortoises. An extreme case indeed, her aunt remarked with admirable gravity, and a most dangerous state of things. And I thought, if I went with a tortoise, there would be only one hare to meet, but if I went with the hare, you know, there were crowds of tortoises. It wasn't a bad idea, said the elder lady as they left the cab at the entrance of Burlington House. You shall have another chance today. We'll have a match in marking pictures. Clara brightened up. I should like to try again very much, she said. I'll take more care this time. How are we to play? To this question, Mad Mathesis made no reply. She was busy drawing lines down the margins of the catalogue. See, she said after a minute. I've drawn three columns against the names of the pictures in the long room, and I want you to fill them with odds and crosses. Crosses for good marks and odds for bad. The first column is for choice of subject, the second for arrangement, the third for coloring. And these are the conditions of the match. You must give three crosses to two or three pictures. You must give two crosses to four or five. Do you mean only two crosses? said Clara. Or may I count the three crossed pictures among the two crossed pictures? Of course you may, said her aunt. Any one that has three eyes may be said to have two eyes, I suppose. Clara followed her aunt's dreamy gaze across the crowded gallery, half dreading to find that there was a three-eyed person in sight. And you must give one cross to nine or ten. And which wins the match? Clara asked, as she carefully entered these conditions on a blank leaf in her catalogue. Whichever marks fewest pictures. But suppose we mark the same number? Then whichever uses most marks. Clara considered. I don't think it's much of a match, she said. I shall mark nine pictures and give three crosses to three of them, two crosses to two more, and one cross each to all the rest. Will you indeed, said her aunt. Wait till you've heard all the conditions, my impetuous child. You must give three odds to one or two pictures, two odds to three or four, and one odd to eight or nine. I don't want you to be too hard on the RAs. Clara quite gasped as she wrote down all these fresh conditions. It's a great deal worse than circulating decimals, she said. But I'm determined to win all the same. Her aunt smiled grimly. We can begin here, she said, as they paused before a gigantic picture, which the catalogue informed them was the portrait of Lieutenant Brown, mounted on his favorite elephant. He looks awfully conceited, said Clara. I don't think he was the elephant's favorite lieutenant. What a hideous picture it is. And it takes up room enough for twenty. Mind what you say, my dear, her aunt interposed. It's by an RA. But Clara was quite reckless. I don't care who it's by, she cried. And I shall give it three bad marks. 
aunt and niece soon drifted away from each other in the crowd and for the next half hour clara was hard at work putting in marks and rubbing them out again and hunting up and down for suitable pictures this she found the hardest part of all i can't find the one i want she exclaimed at last almost crying with vexation what is it you want to find my dear the voice was strange to clara but so sweet and gentle that she felt attracted to the owner of it even before she had seen her and when she turned and met the smiling looks of two little old ladies whose round dimpled faces exactly alike seemed never to have known a care it was as much as she could do as she confessed to aunt mattie afterwards to keep herself from hugging them both i was looking for a picture she said that has a good subject and that's well arranged but badly colored the little old ladies glanced at each other in some alarm calm yourself my dear said the one who had spoken first and try to remember which it was what was the subject was it an elephant for instance the other sister suggested they were still in sight of lieutenant brown i don't know indeed clara impetuously replied you know it doesn't matter a bit what the subject is so long as it's a good one once more the sisters exchanged looks of alarm and one of them whispered something to the other of which clara caught only the one word mad they mean aunt mattie of course she said to herself fancying in her innocence that london was like a native town where everybody knew everybody else if you mean my aunt she added aloud she's there just three pictures beyond lieutenant brown ah well then you better go to her my dear her new friend said soothingly she'll find you the picture you want good-bye dear good-bye dear echoed the other sister mind you don't lose sight of your aunt and the pair trotted off into another room leaving clara rather perplexed at their manner they're real darlings she soliloquized i wonder why they pity me so and she wandered on murmuring to herself it must have two good marks and end of chapter five chapter six of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter six not six her radiancy one piecey sing said may have got must key said sing my not can do you talk you not say be what bamboo footnote mas key in pidgin english means without End footnote. they landed and were at once conducted to the palace about half way they were met by the governor who welcomed them in english a great relief to our travellers whose guide could speak nothing but kugovchnian i don't half like the way they grin at us as we go by the old man whispered to his son and why do they say bamboo so often it alludes to a local custom replied the governor who had overheard the question such persons as happen in any way to displease her radiancy are usually beaten with rods the old man shuddered a most objectionable local custom he remarked with strong emphasis i wish we had never landed did you notice that black fellow norman opening his great mouth at us i verily believe he would like to eat us norman appealed to the governor who was walking at his other side do they often eat distinguished strangers here he said in as indifferent a tone as he could assume not often not ever was the welcome reply they are not good for it pigs we eat for they are fat this old man is thin and thankful to be so muttered the elder traveller beaten we shall be without a doubt it's a comfort to know it won't be beaten without the bee my dear boy just look at the peacocks they were now walking between two unbroken lines of those gorgeous birds each held in check by means of a golden collar and chain by a black slave who stood well behind so as not to interrupt the view of the glittering tail with its network of rustling feathers and its hundred eyes the governor smiled proudly 
In your honor, he said, her radiancy has ordered up 10,000 additional peacocks. She will no doubt decorate you before you go with the usual star and feathers. It'll be star without the S, faltered one of his hearers. Come, come, don't lose heart, said the other. All this is full of charm for me. You are young, Norman, sighed his father, young and light-hearted. For me, it's charm without the sea. The old one is sad, the governor remarked with some anxiety. He has without doubt effected some fearful crime. But I haven't, the poor old gentleman hastily exclaimed. Tell him I haven't, Norman. He has not as yet, Norman gently explained, and the governor repeated in a satisfied tone. Not as yet. Yours is a wondrous country, the governor resumed after a pause. Now here is a letter from a friend of mine, a merchant in London. He and his brother went there a year ago with a thousand pounds apiece, and on New Year's Day they had sixty thousand pounds between them. How did they do it? Norman eagerly exclaimed. Even the elder traveller looked excited. The governor handed him the open letter. Anybody can do it when once they know how, so ran this oracular document. We borrowed naught, we stole naught. We began the year with only a thousand pounds apiece, and last New Year's Day we had sixty thousand pounds between us, sixty thousand golden sovereigns. Norman looked grave and thoughtful as he handed back the letter. His father hazarded one guess. Was it by gambling? A Kogovchinian never gambles, said the governor gravely as he ushered them through the palace gates. They followed him in silence down a long passage and soon found themselves in a lofty hall, lined entirely with peacock's feathers. In the center was a pile of crimson cushions which almost concealed the figure of her radiancy, a plump little damsel in a robe of green satin dotted with silver stars, whose pale round face lit up for a moment with a half smile as the travelers bowed before her, and then relapsed into the exact expression of a wax doll while she languidly murmured a word or two in the Kokovchinian dialect. The governor interpreted. Her radiancy welcomes you. She notes the impenetrable placidity of the old one and the imperceptible acuteness of the youth. Here the little potentate clapped her hands and a troop of slaves instantly appeared, carrying trays of coffee and sweetmeats, which they offered to the guests, who had, at a signal from the governor, seated themselves on the carpet. Sugar plums, muttered the old man. One might as well be at the confectioner's. Ask for a penny bun, Norman. Not so loud, his son whispered. Say something complimentary, for the governor was evidently expecting a speech. We thank her exalted potency, the old man timidly began. We bask in the light of her smile, which... The words of old men are weak, the governor interrupted angrily. Let's say you speak. Tell her, cried Norman, in a wild burst of eloquence, that, like two grasshoppers in a volcano, we are shriveled up in the presence of her spangled vehemence. It is well, said the governor, and translated this into Kugovchinian. I am now to tell you, he proceeded, what her radiancy requires of you before you go. The yearly competition for the post of imperial scarf-maker is just ended. You are the judges. You will take account of the rate of work, the lightness of the scarves, and their warmth. Usually the competitors differ in one point only. Thus, last year, Fifi and Gogo made the same number of scarves in the trial week, and they were equally light. But Fifi's were twice as warm as Gogo's, and she was pronounced twice as good. But this year, who is me, who can judge it? Three competitors are here, and they differ in all points. While you settle their claims, you shall be lodged, her radiancy bids me say, free of expense, in the best dungeon, and abundantly fed on the best bread and water. The old man groaned. All is lost, he wildly exclaimed. But Norman heeded him not. He had taken out his notebook and was calmly jotting down the particulars. Three day be, the governor proceeded. Lolo, Mimi, and Zuzu. Lolo makes five scarves, while Mimi makes two. But Zuzu makes four, while Lola makes three. Again, so fairy-like is Zuzu's handiwork. Five of her scarves weigh no more than one of Lolo's. Yet Mimi's is lighter still. Five of hers will but balance three of Zuzu's. 
and for once one of Mimi's is equal to four of Suzu's, yet one of Lolo's is as warm as three of Mimi's. Here the little lady once more clapped her hands. It's our sign of dismissal, the governor hastily said. Pay her radiancy your farewell compliments and walk out backwards. The walking part was all the elder tourist could manage. Norman simply said, Tell her radiancy we are transfixed by the spectacle of her serene brilliance and bid an agonized farewell to her condensed milkiness. Her radiancy is pleased, the governor reported after Julie translating this. She casts on you a glance from her imperial eyes and is confident that you will catch it. That I warrant we shall, the elder traveler moaned to himself distractedly. Once more they bowed low and then followed the governor down a winding staircase to the imperial dungeon, which they found to be lined with colored marble, lighted from the roof and splendidly though no luxuriously furnished with a bench of polished malachite. I trust you will not delay the calculation, the governor said, ushering them in with much ceremony. I have known great inconvenience, great and serious inconvenience, result to those unhappy ones who have delayed to execute the commands of her radiancy. And on this occasion she is resolute. She says the thing must and shall be done, and she has ordered up ten thousand additional bamboos. With these words he left them, and they heard him lock and bar the door on the outside. I told you how it would end moaned the elder traveller, wringing his hands, and quite forgetting in his anguish that he had himself proposed the expedition and had never predicted anything of the sort. Oh, that we were well out of this miserable business! Courage! cried the younger cheerily. Huck olim meminisse juvabit! The end of all this will be glory! Glory without the L, was all the poor old man could say, as he rocked himself to and fro on the malachite bench. Glory without the L! End of chapter 6。Chapter 7 of A Tangled Tale。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Avai in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll。Chapter 7 。Not 7 。Petty Cash。Base is the slave that pays。Aunt Mattie, my child, would you mind writing it down at once? I shall be quite certain to forget it if you don't. My dear, we really must wait till the cab stops. How can I possibly write anything in the midst of all this jolting? But really I shall be forgetting it. Clara's voice took the plaintive tone that her aunt never knew how to resist, and with a sigh the old lady drew forth her ivory tablets and prepared to record the amount that Clara had just spent at the confectioner's shop. Her expenditure was always made out of her aunt's purse, but the poor girl knew, by bitter experience, that sooner or later Mad Mathesis would expect an exact account of every penny that had gone, and she waited with ill-concealed impatience while the old lady turned the tablets over and over till she had found the one-headed petty cash. Here's the place, she said at last, and here we have yesterday's luncheon duly entered. One glass lemonade, why can't you drink water like me? Three sandwiches. They never put in half mustard enough. I told the young woman so to her face, and she tossed her head, like her impudence. And seven biscuits. Total, one and two pence. Well, now for today's. One glass of lemonade, Clara was beginning to say, when suddenly the cab drew up and a courteous railway porter was handing out the bewildered girl before she had had time to finish her sentence. Her aunt pocketed the tablets instantly. Business first, she said. Petty cash, which is a form of pleasure, whatever you may think, afterwards. And she proceeded to pay the driver and to give voluminous orders about the luggage, quite deaf to the entreaties of her unhappy niece that she would enter the rest of the luncheon account. My dear, you really must cultivate a more capacious mind, was all the consolation she vouchsafed to the poor girl. Are not the tablets of your memory wide enough to contain the record of one single luncheon? Not wide enough, not half wide enough, was the passionate reply. The voice came in aptly enough, but the voice was not that of Clara, and both ladies turned in some surprise to see who it was that had so suddenly struck into their conversation. 
a fat little old lady was standing at the door of a cab helping the driver to extricate what seemed an exact duplicate of herself it would have been no easy task to decide which was the fatter or which looked the more good-humoured of the two sisters i tell you the cab door isn't half wide enough she repeated as her sister finally emerged somewhat after the fashion of a pellet from a pop-gun and she turned to appeal to clara is it dear she said trying hard to bring a frown into a face that dimpled all over with smiles some folks is too wide for em growled the cab-driver don't provoke me man cried the little old lady in what she meant for a tempest of fury say another word and i'll put you into the county court and sue you for a habeas corpus the cabman touched his hat and marched off grinning nothing like a little law to cow the ruffians my dear she remarked confidentially to clara you saw how he quailed when i mentioned the habeas corpus not that i've any idea what it means but it sounds very grand doesn't it it's very provoking clara replied a little vaguely very the little old lady eagerly repeated and we're very much provoked indeed aren't we sister i never was so provoked in all my life the fatter sister assented radiantly by this time clara had recognized her picture gallery acquaintances and drawing her aunt aside she hastily whispered her reminiscences i met them first in the royal academy and they were very kind to me and they were lunching at the next table to us just now you know and they tried to help me to find the picture i wanted and i'm sure they're dear old things friends of yours are they said matt mathesis well i like their looks you can be civil to them while i get the tickets but do try and arrange your ideas a little more chronologically and so it came to pass that the four ladies found themselves seated side by side on the same bench waiting for the train and chatting as if they had known one another for years now this i call quite a remarkable coincidence exclaimed the smaller and more talkative of the two sisters the one whose legal knowledge had annihilated the cab driver not only that we should be waiting for the same train and at the same station that would be curious enough but actually on the same day and the same hour of the day that's what strikes me so forcibly she glanced at the fatter and more silent sister whose chief function in life seemed to be to support the family opinion and who meekly responded and me too sister those are not independent coincidences mad mathesis was just beginning when clara ventured to interpose there's no jolting here she pleaded meekly would you mind writing it down now out came the ivory tablets once more what was it then said her aunt one glass of lemonade one sandwich one biscuit oh dear me cried poor clara the historical tone suddenly changing to a wail of agony toothache said her aunt calmly as she wrote down the items the two sisters instantly opened their reticules and produced two different remedies for neuralgia each marked unequalled it isn't that said poor clara thank you very much it's only that i can't remember how much i paid well try and make it out then said her aunt you've got yesterday's luncheon to help you you know and here's the luncheon we had the day before the first day we went to that shop one glass lemonade four sandwiches ten biscuits total one and five pence she handed the tablets to clara who gazed at them with eyes so dim with tears that she did not at first notice that she was holding them upside down the two sisters had been listening to all this with the deepest interest and at this juncture the smaller one softly laid her hand on clara's arm do you know my dear she said coaxingly my sister and i are in the very same predicament quite identically the very same predicament aren't we sister quite identically and absolutely the very began the fatter sister but she was constructing her sentence on too large a scale and the little one would not wait for her to finish it yes my dear she resumed we were lunching at the very same shop as you were and we had two glasses of lemonade and three sandwiches and five biscuits and neither of us has the least idea what we paid have we sister 
quite identically and absolutely murmured the other who evidently considered that she was now a whole sentence in arrears and that she ought to discharge one obligation before contracting any fresh liabilities but the little lady broke in again and she retired from the conversation a bankrupt would you make it out for us my dear pleaded the little old lady you can do arithmetic i trust her aunt said a little anxiously as clara turned from one tablet to another vainly trying to collect her thoughts her mind was a blank and all human expression was rapidly fading out of her face a gloomy silence ensued End of chapter seven chapter eight of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Hawaii in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 8 Not 8 The Omnibus Rebus This little pig went to market. This little pig stayed at home. By Her Radiancy's express command, said the governor as he conducted the travellers for the last time from the imperial presence i shall now have the ecstasy of escorting you as far as the outer gate of the military quarter where the agony of parting if indeed nature can survive the shock must be endured from said gate grom stips start every quarter of an hour both ways would you mind repeating that word said norman grom grom stips the governor repeated you call them omnibuses in england they run both ways and you can travel by one of them all the way down to the harbour the old man breathed a sigh of relief four hours of courtly ceremony had wearied him and he had been in constant terror lest something should call into use the ten thousand additional bamboos in another minute they were crossing a large quadrangle paved with marble and tastefully decorated with a pigsty in each corner soldiers carrying pigs were marching in all directions and in the middle stood a gigantic officer giving orders in a voice of thunder which made itself heard above all the uproar of the pigs it is the commander-in-chief the governor hurriedly whispered to his companions who at once followed his example in prostrating themselves before the great man the commander gravely bowed in return he was covered with gold lace from head to foot his face wore an expression of deep misery and he had a little black pig under each arm still the gallant fellow did his best in the midst of the orders he was every moment issuing to his men to bid a courteous farewell to the departing guests farewell o old one carry this three to the south corner and farewell to thee thou young one put this fat one on the top of the others in the western sty may your shadows never be less woe is me it is wrongly done empty out all the styes and begin again and the soldier leant upon his sword and wiped away a tear he is in distress the governor explained as they left the court her radiancy has commanded him to place twenty-four pigs in those four styes so that as she goes round the court she may always find the number in each sty nearer to ten than the number in the last does she call ten nearer to ten than nine is said norman surely said the governor her radiancy would admit that ten is nearer to ten than nine is and also nearer than eleven is then i think it can be done said norman the governor shook his head the commander has been transferring them in vain for four months he said what hope remains and her radiancy has ordered up ten thousand additional the pigs don't seem to enjoy being transferred the old man hastily interrupted he did not like the subject of bamboos they are only provisionally transferred you know said the governor in most cases they are immediately carried back again so they need not mind it and all is done with the greatest care under the personal superintendence of the commander-in-chief of course she would only go once round said norman alas no sighed their conductor round and round round and round these are her radiance's own words but oh agony here is the outer gate and we must part he sobbed as he shook hands with them and the next moment was briskly walking away he might have waited to see us off said the old man piteously and he needn't have begun whistling the very moment he left us said the young one severely 
But look sharp, here are two, what's his names, in the act of starting. Unluckily, the sea-bound omnibus was full. Never mind, said Norman cheerily. We'll walk on till the next one overtakes us. They trudged on in silence, both thinking over the military problem, till they met an omnibus coming from the sea. The elder traveller took out his watch. Just twelve minutes and a half since we started, he remarked in an absent manner. Suddenly the vacant face brightened. The old man had an idea. My boy, he shouted, bringing his hand down upon Norman's shoulder so suddenly as for a moment to transfer his centre of gravity beyond the base of support. Thus taken off his guard, the young man wildly staggered forwards and seemed about to plunge into space. But in another moment he had gracefully recovered himself. Problem in procession and notation, he remarked, in tones where filial respect only just managed to conceal a shade of annoyance. What is it? he hastily added, fearing his father might have been taken ill. Will you have some brandy? When will the next omnibus overtake us? When? When? the old man cried, growing more excited every moment. Norman looked gloomily. Give me time, he said. I must think it over. And once more the travellers passed on in silence, a silence only broken by the distant squeals of the unfortunate little pigs, who were still being provisionally transferred from sty to sty under the personal superintendence of the commander-in-chief. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of A Tangled Tale – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Nine. Not Nine. A Serpent with Corners. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. It'll just take one more pebble. Whatever are you doing with those buckets? The speakers were you and Lambert. Place, the beach of Little Mendip. Time, 1.30 p.m. Hugh was floating a bucket in another a size larger and trying how many pebbles it would carry without sinking. Lambert was lying on his back, doing nothing. For the next minute or two, Hugh was silent, evidently deep in thought. Suddenly he started. I say, look here, Lambert he cried. If it's alive and slimy and with legs I don't care to, said Lambert. Didn't Balbus say this morning that if a body is immersed in liquid it displaces as much liquid as is equal to its own bulk, said Hugh. He said things of that sort, Lambert vaguely replied. Well, just look here a minute. Here's the little bucket, almost quite immersed, so the water displaced ought to be just about the same bulk. And now just look at it. He took out the little bucket as he spoke, and handed the big one to Lambert. Why, there's hardly a teacup full. Do you mean to say that water is the same bulk as the little bucket? Course it is, said Lambert. Well, look here again cried Hugh triumphantly as he poured the water from the big bucket into the little one. Why, it doesn't half fill it! That's its business, said Lambert. If Balbus says it's the same bulk, why, it is the same bulk, you know. Well, I don't believe it, said Hugh. You needn't, said Lambert. Besides, it's dinner time. Come along. They found Balbus waiting dinner for them, and to him Hugh at once propounded his difficulty. Let's get you helped first, said Balbus, briskly cutting away at the joint. You know the old proverb, mutton first, mechanics afterwards. The boys did not know the proverb, but they accepted it in perfect good faith, as they did every piece of information, however startling, that came from so infallible an authority as their tutor. They ate on steadily in silence, and, when dinner was over, Hugh set out the usual array of pens, ink, and paper, while Balbus repeated to them the problem he had prepared for their afternoon's task. A friend of mine has a flower garden, a very pretty one, though no great size. How big is it? said Hugh. That's what you have to find out, Balbus gaily replied. All I tell you is that it is oblong in shape just half a yard longer than its width, 
and that a gravel walk one yard wide begins at one corner and runs all round it joining into itself said hugh not joining into itself young man just before doing that it turns a corner and runs round the garden again alongside of the first portion and then inside that again winding in and in and each lap touching the last one till it has used up the whole of the area like a serpent with corners said lambert exactly so and if you walk the whole length of it to the last inch keeping in the centre of the path it's exactly two miles and half a furlong now while you find out the length and breadth of the garden i'll see if i can think out that sea-water puzzle you said it was a flower garden hugh inquired as balbus was leaving the room i did said balbus where do the flowers grow said hugh but balbus thought it best not to hear the question he left the boys to their problem and in the silence of his own room set himself to unravel hugh's mechanical paradox to fix our thoughts he murmured to himself as with hands deep buried in his pockets he paced up and down the room we will take a cylindrical glass jar with a scale of inches marked up the side and fill it with water up to the ten inch mark and we will assume that every inch depth of jar contains a pint of water we will now take a solid cylinder such that every inch of it is equal in bulk to half a pint of water and plunge four inches of it into the water so that the end of the cylinder comes down to the six inch mark well that displaces two pints of water what becomes of them why if there were no more cylinder they would lie comfortably on top and fill the jar up to the twelve inch mark but unfortunately there is more cylinder occupying half the space between the ten inch and the twelve inch marks so that only one pint of water can be accommodated there what becomes of the other pint why if there were no more cylinder it would lie on the top and fill the jar up to the thirteen inch mark but unfortunately shade of newton he exclaimed in sudden accents of terror when does the water stop rising a bright idea struck him i'll write a little essay on it he said balbus's essay when a solid is immersed in a liquid it is well known that it displaces a portion of the liquid equal to itself in bulk and that the level of the liquid rises just so much as it would rise if a quantity of liquid had been added to it equal in bulk to the solid lardner says precisely the same process occurs when a solid is partially immersed the quantity of liquid displaced in this case equaling the portion of the solid which is immersed and the rise of the level being in proportion suppose a solid held above the surface of a liquid and partially immersed a portion of the liquid is displaced and the level of the liquid rises but by this rise of level a little bit more of the solid is of course immersed and so there is a new displacement of a second portion of the liquid and a consequent rise of level again this second rise of level causes a yet further immersion and by consequence another displacement of liquid and another rise it is self-evident that this process must continue till the entire solid is immersed and that the liquid will then begin to immerse whatever holds the solid which being connected with it must for the time be considered a part of it if you hold a stick six feet long with its end in a tumbler of water and wait long enough you must eventually be immersed the question as to the source from which the water is supplied which belongs to a high branch of mathematics and is therefore beyond our present scope does not apply to the sea let us therefore take the familiar instance of a man standing at the edge of the sea at ebb tide with a solid in his hand which he partially immerses he remains steadfast and unmoved and we all know that he must be drowned the multitudes who daily perish in this manner to attest the philosophical truth and whose bodies the unreasoning wave casts sullenly upon our thankless shores have a truer claim to be called the martyrs of science than a galileo or a kepler to use cother's eloquent phrase they are the unnamed demigods of the nineteenth century footnote note by the writer for the above essay i am indebted to a dear friend now deceased 
End footnote. There's a fallacy somewhere, he murmured drowsily as he stretched his long legs upon the sofa. I must think it over again. He closed his eyes in order to concentrate his attention more perfectly, and for the next hour or so his slow and regular breathing bore witness to the careful deliberation with which he was investigating this new and perplexing view of the subject. End of chapter Chapter 10 of A Tangled Tale This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 10 Not 10 Chelsea Buns Yeah, buns and buns and buns Old song How very, very sad exclaimed Clara, and the eyes of the gentle girl filled with tears as she spoke. Sad, but very curious when you come to look at it arithmetically, was her aunt's less romantic reply. Some of them have lost an arm in their country's service, some a leg, some an ear, some an eye, and some, perhaps, all, Clara murmured dreamily as they passed the long rows of weather-beaten heroes basking in the sun. Did you notice that very old one with a red face who was drawing a map in the dust with his wooden leg and all the others watching? I think it was a plan of a battle. The Battle of Trafalgar, no doubt, her aunt interrupted briskly. Hardly that, I think, Clara ventured to say. You see, in that case he couldn't well be alive. Couldn't well be alive, the old lady contemptuously repeated. He's as lively as you and me put together. Why, if drawing a map in the dust with one's wooden leg doesn't prove one to be alive, perhaps you'll kindly mention what does prove it. Clara did not see her way out of it. Logic had never been her forte. To return to the arithmetic, Mad Mathesis resumed, the eccentric old lady never let slip an opportunity of driving her niece into a calculation. What percentage do you suppose must have lost all four? A leg, an arm, an eye, and an ear? How can I tell? gasped the terrified girl. She knew well what was coming. You can't, of course, without data, her aunt replied. But I'm just going to give you... Give her a Chelsea bun, miss. That's what most young ladies likes best. The voice was rich and musical, and the speaker dexterously whipped back the snowy cloth that covered his basket, and disclosed a tempting array of the familiar square buns, joined together in rows, richly egged and browned, and glistening in the sun. No, sir, I shall give her nothing so indigestible. Be off! The old lady waved her parasol threateningly, but nothing seemed to disturb the good humor of the jolly old man, who marched on, chanting his melodious refrain. Chelsea buns, Chelsea buns hot, Chelsea buns. Piping hot, Chelsea buns hot, Chelsea buns. Far too indigestible, my love, said the old lady. Percentages will agree with you ever so much better. Clara sighed, and there was a hungry look in her eyes as she watched the basket lessening in the distance. But she meekly listened to the relentless old lady, who at once proceeded to count off the data on her fingers. Say that 70% have lost an eye, 75% an ear, 80% an arm, 85% a leg. That'll do it beautifully. Now, my dear, what percentage, at least, must have lost all four? No more conversation occurred, unless a smothered exclamation of piping hot, which escaped from Clara's lips as the basket vanished round the corner, could be counted as such, until they reached the old Chelsea mansion where Clara's father was then staying with his three sons and their old tutor. Balbus, Lambert and Hugh had entered the house only a few minutes before them. They had been out walking and Hugh had been propounding a difficulty which had reduced Lambert to the depths of gloom and had even puzzled Balbus. It changes from Wednesday to Thursday at midnight, doesn't it? Hugh had begun. Sometimes, said Balbus cautiously. Always, said Lambert decisively. Sometimes, Balbus gently insisted. Six midnights out of seven it changes to some other name. I meant, of course, Hugh corrected himself. When it does change from Wednesday to Thursday, it does it at midnight, and only at midnight. 
Surely, said Balbus. Lambert was silent. Well, now suppose it's midnight here in Chelsea. Then it's Wednesday west of Chelsea, say in Ireland or America, where midnight hasn't arrived yet. And it's Thursday east of Chelsea, say in Germany or Russia, where midnight has just passed by. Surely, Balbus said again. Even Lambert nodded this time. But it isn't midnight anywhere else, so it can't be changing from one day to another anywhere else. And yet, if Ireland and America and so on call it Wednesday, and Germany and Russia and so on call it Thursday, there must be some place, not Chelsea, that has different days on the two sides of it. And the worst of it is, the people there get their days in the wrong order. They've got Wednesday east of them, and Thursday west, just as if their day had changed from Thursday to Wednesday. I've heard that puzzle before, cried Lambert, and I'll tell you the explanation. When a ship goes round the world from east to west, we know that it loses a day in its reckoning, so that when it gets home and calls its day Wednesday, it finds people here calling it Thursday, because we've had one more midnight than the ship has had. And when you go the other way round, you gain a day. I know all that, said Hugh in reply to this not very lucid explanation. But it doesn't help me, because the ship hasn't proper days. One way round you get more than 24 hours to the day, and the other way you get less, so of course the names get wrong. But people that live on in one place always get 24 hours to the day. I suppose there is such a place, Balbus said meditatively, though I never heard of it. And the people must find it very queer, as Hugh says, to have the old day east of them and the new one west, because when midnight comes round to them, with the new day in front of it and the old one behind it, one doesn't see exactly what happens. I must think it over. So they had entered the house in the state I have described. Balbus puzzled and Lambert buried in gloomy thought. Yes, mm. master is at home, mm, said the stately old butler. Nota bene. It is only a butler of experience who can manage a series of three M's together without any interjacent vowels. And the old party is awaiting for you in the library. I don't like his calling your father an old party, Mad Mathesis whispered to her niece as they crossed the hall. And Clara had only just time to whisper in reply, he meant the whole party, before they were ushered into the library, and the sight of the five solemn faces there assembled chilled her into silence. Her father sat at the head of the table and mutely signed to the ladies to take the two vacant chairs, one on each side of him. His three sons and Balbus completed the party. Writing materials had been arranged round the table, after the fashion of a ghostly banquet. The butler had evidently bestowed much thought on the grim device. Sheets of quarto paper, each flanked by a pen on one side and a pencil on the other, represented the plates. Pen wipers did duty for rolls of bread, while ink bottles stood in the places usually occupied by wine glasses. The pièce de résistance was a large green baize bag, which gave forth, as the old man restlessly lifted it from side to side, a charming jingle as of innumerable golden guineas. Sister, daughter, sons... And Balbus, the old man began, so nervously that Balbus put in a gentle, Hear, hear, while Hugh drummed on the table with his fists. This disconcerted the unpractised orator. Sister, he began again, then paused a moment, moved the bag to the other side, and went on with a rush. I mean, this being a critical occasion, more or less, being the year when one of my sons comes of age, he paused again in some confusion, having evidently got into the middle of his speech sooner than he intended, but it was too late to go back. Hear, hear, cried Balbus. Quite so, said the old gentleman, recovering his self-possession a little. When first I began this annual custom, my friend Balbus will correct me if I am wrong, Hugh whispered, with a strap, but nobody heard him except Lambert, who only frowned and shook his head at him. This annual custom of giving each of my sons as many guineas as would represent his age. It was a critical time, so Balbus informed me, as the ages of two of you were together equal to that of the third. So on that occasion I made a speech. He paused so long that Balbus thought it well to come to the rescue with the words, It was at most 
but the old man checked him with a warning look yes made a speech he repeated a few years after that balbus pointed out i say pointed out here here cried balbus quite so said the grateful old man that it was another critical occasion the ages of two of you were together double that of the third so i made another speech another speech and now again it's a critical occasion so balbus says and i am making here mad mathis is pointedly referred to her watch all the haste i can the old man cried with wonderful presence of mind indeed sister i'm coming to the point now the number of years that have passed since that first occasion is just two-thirds of the number of guineas i then gave you now my boys calculate your ages from the data and you shall have the money but we know our ages cried hugh silence sir thundered the old man rising to his full height he was exactly five foot five in his indignation i say you must use the data only you mustn't even assume which it is that comes of age he clutched the bag as he spoke and with tottering steps it was about as much as he could do to carry it he left the room and you shall have a similar cadeau the old lady whispered to her niece when you've calculated that percentage and she followed her brother nothing could exceed the solemnity with which the old couple had risen from the table and yet was it was it a grin with which the father turned away from his unhappy sons could it be could it be a wink with which the aunt abandoned her despairing niece and were those were those sounds of suppressed chuckling which floated into the room just before balbus who had followed them out closed the door surely not and yet the butler told the cook but no that was merely idle gossip and i will not repeat it the shades of evening granted their unuttered petition and closed not o'er them for the butler brought in the lamp the same obliging shades left them a lonely bark the wail of a dog in the backyard baying the moon for a while but neither morn alas nor any other epoch seemed likely to restore them to that peace of mind which had once been theirs ere ever these problems had swooped upon them and crushed them with a load of unfathomable mystery it's hardly fair muttered you to give us such a jumble as this to work out fair clara echoed bitterly well and to all my readers i can but repeat the last words of gentle clara farewell End of chapter ten chapter eleven of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter eleven appendix a knot said alice oh do let me help to undo it answers to knot one problem two travellers spend from three o'clock till nine in walking along a level road up a hill and home again their pace on the level being four miles an hour uphill three and downhill six find distance walked also within half an hour time of reaching top of hill answer twenty four miles half past six solution a level mile takes a quarter of an hour uphill one-third downhill one-sixth hence to go and return over the same mile whether on the level or on the hillside takes half an hour hence in six hours they went twelve miles out and twelve back if the twelve miles out had been nearly all level they would have taken a little over three hours if nearly all uphill a little under four hence three and a half hours must be within one half an hour of the time taken in reaching the peak thus as they started at three they got there within half an hour of half past six twenty-seven answers have come in of these nine are right sixteen partially right and two wrong 
the sixteen give the distance correctly but they have failed to grasp the fact that the top of the hill might have been reached at any moment between six o'clock and seven the two wrong answers are from gertie vernon and a nihilist the former makes the distance twenty three miles while her revolutionary companion puts it at twenty seven Gertie Vernon says they had to go four miles along the plain and got to the foot of the hill at four o'clock. They might have done so, I grant, but you have no ground for saying they did so. It was seven and a half miles to the top of the hill and they reached that at a quarter before seven o'clock. Here you go wrong in your arithmetic and I must, however reluctantly, bid you farewell seven and a half miles at three miles an hour would not require two hours and three quarters a nihilist says let x denote the whole number of miles y the number of hours to hilltop therefore three y equals the number of miles to hilltop and x minus three y equals the number of miles on the other side you bewilder me the other side of what of the hill you say but then how did they get home again however to accommodate your views we will build a new hostelry at the foot of the hill on the opposite side and also assume what i grant you is possible though it is not necessarily true that there was no level road at all even then you go wrong you say one y equals six minus the quantity x minus three y divided by six two x over four and a half equals six i grant you one but i deny two it rests on the assumption that to go part of the time at three miles an hour and the rest at six miles an hour comes to the same result as going the whole time at four and a half miles an hour but this would only be true if the part were an exact half, that is, if they went uphill for three hours and downhill for the other three, which they certainly did not do. The sixteen who are partially right are Agnes Bailey, F. K., Fifi, G. E. B., H. P., Kit, M. E. T., Mizey, a mother's son, Nairam, a Red Ruthian, a socialist, spear maiden, TBC, vis inertiae, and yak. Of these, FK, Fifi, TBC, and vis inertiae do not attempt a second part at all. FK and HP give no working. The rest make particular assumptions, such as that there was no level road, that there were six miles of level road, and so on all leading to particular times being fixed for reaching the hilltop. The most curious assumption is that of Agnes Bailey, who says, Let x equal the number of hours occupied in ascent, then x and a half equals the hours occupied in descent, and 4x over 3 equals the hours occupied on the level. I suppose you were thinking of the relative rates uphill and on the level, which we might express by saying that, if they went x miles uphill in a certain time, they would go 4x over 3 miles on the level in the same time. You have, in fact, assumed that they took the same time on the level that they took in ascending the hill. Fifi assumes that, when the aged knight said they had gone 4 miles in the hour on the level, he meant that 4 miles was the distance gone, not merely the rate. This would have been, if Fifi will excuse the slang expression, a cell, ill-suited to the dignity of the hero. And now descend, ye classic nine, who have solved the whole problem, and let me sing your praises. Your names are Blythe, E.W., L.B., a Marlborough boy, O.V.L., Putney Walker, Rose, Seabreeze, Simple Susan, and Money Spinner. These last two I count as one as they sent a joint answer. 
Rose and Simple Susan and Co. do not actually state that the hilltop was reached sometime between 6 and 7, but, as they have clearly grasped the fact that a mile, ascended and descended, took the same time as two level miles, I mark them as right. A Marlborough boy and Putney Walker deserve honorable mention for their algebraical solutions being the only two who have perceived that the question leads to an indeterminate equation. E.W. brings a charge of untruthfulness against the aged knight, a serious charge, for he was the very pink of chivalry. She says, According to the data given, the time at the summit affords no clue to the total distance. It does not enable us to state precisely to an inch how much level and how much hill there was in the road. Fair damsel, the aged knight replies, if, as I surmise, thy initials denote early womanhood, bethink thee that the word enable is thine, not mine. I did but ask the time of reaching the hilltop as my condition for further parley. If now thou wilt not grant that I am a truth-loving man, then will I affirm that those same initials denote evenomed wickedness. Class list. First, a Marlborough boy, Putney Walker. Second, Blythe, E.W., L.B., O.V.L., Rose, Seabreeze, Simple Susan and Money Spinner. Blythe has made so ingenious an addition to the problem, and Simple Susan and Co. have solved it in such tuneful verse that I record both their answers in full. I have altered a word or two in Blythe's, which I trust she will excuse. It did not seem quite as clear as it stood. Yet stay, said the youth, as a gleam of inspiration lighted up the relaxing muscles of his quiescent features. Stay. Methinks it matters little when we reach that summit, the crown of our toil. For in the space of time wherein we clambered up one mile and bounded down the same on our return, we could have trudged the twain on the level. We have plodded, then, four and twenty miles in these six mortal hours, for never a moment did we stop for catching a fleeting breath or for gazing on the scene around. Very good, said the old man. Twelve miles out and twelve miles in, and we reach the top some time between six and seven of the clock. Now mark me, for every five minutes that had fled since six of the clock when we stood on yonder peak, so many miles had we toiled upwards on the dreary mountain side. The youth moaned and rushed into the hostel. Blythe The elder and the younger knight, they sallied forth at three, how far they went on level ground, it matters not to me. What time they reached the foot of hill when they began to mount are problems which I hold to be of very small account. The moment that each waved his hat upon the topmost peak to trivial queries such as this, no answer will I seek. Yet can I tell the distance well they must have travelled over, on hill and plain twixt three and nine, the miles were twenty-four. Four miles an hour their steady pace along the level track, three when they climbed, but six when they came swiftly striding back down the hill, and little skill it needs methinks to show, up hill and down together told, four miles an hour they go. For whether long or short the time upon the hill they spent, two-thirds were passed in going up, one-third in the descent. Two-thirds at three, one-third at six, if rightly reckoned o'er, will make one hole at four. The tale is tangled now no more. Simple Susan, Money Spinner End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of A Tangled Tale」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Twelve. Answers to Not Two. Paragraph One. The Dinner Party. Problem. The Governor of Kogovchny wants to give a very small dinner party 
and invites his father's brother-in-law, his brother's father-in-law, his father-in-law's brother, and his brother-in-law's father. Find the number of guests. Answer 1. In this genealogy, males are denoted by capitals and females by small letters. The governor is capital E and his guest is capital C. Ten answers have been received. Of these, one is wrong. Galanthus Nivalis Major, who insists on inviting two guests, one being the governor's wife's brother's father. If she had taken his sister's husband's father instead, she would have found it possible to reduce the guests to one. Of the nine who send right answers, Sea Breeze is the very faintest breath that ever bore the name. She simply states that the governor's uncle might fulfill all the conditions by intermarriages. Wind of the Western Sea, you have had a very narrow escape. Be thankful to appear in the class list at all. Bog Oak and Bradshaw of the future use genealogies which require 16 people instead of 14 by inviting the governor's father's sister's husband instead of his father's wife's brother. I cannot think this so good a solution as one that requires only 14. Caius and Valentine deserve special mention as the only two who have supplied genealogies. Class list. First, B. Caius, M.M., Mathematics, Old Cat, Valentine. Second, Bog Oak, Bradshaw of the Future. Third, Seabreeze. Paragraph 2. The Lodgings. Problem. A square has 20 doors on each side, which contains 21 equal parts. They are numbered all round, beginning at one corner. From which of the four, numbers 9, 25, 52, 73, is the sum of the distance to the other three least? Answer from number 9. Let A be number 9, B number 25, C number 52, and D number 73. Then AB equals the square root of the quantity 12 squared plus 5 squared, equals the square root of 169 equals 13. AC equals 21. AD equals the square root of the quantity 9 squared plus 8 squared, equals the square root of 145, equals 12 plus. Nota bene, that is, between 12 and 13. BC equals the square root of the quantity 16 squared plus 12 squared equals the square root of 400 equals 20. BD equals the square root of the quantity 3 squared plus 21 squared equals the square root of 450 equals 21 plus. CD equals the square root of the quantity 9 squared plus 13 squared equals the square root of 250 equals 15 plus. Hence, sum of distances from A is between 46 and 47, from B between 54 and 55, from C between 56 and 57, from D between 48 and 51. Why not between 48 and 49? Make this out for yourselves. Hence, the sum is least for A. 25 solutions have been received. Of these, 15 must be marked 0, 5 are partly right and 5 right. Of the 15, I may dismiss Alphabetical Phantom, Bog Oak, Dynamite, Fifi, Galanthus Nivalis Major, I fear the cold spring has blighted our snowdrop, Guy, HMS, Pinafore, Janet, and Valentine with the simple remark that they insist on the unfortunate lodgers keeping to the pavement. I use the words crossed to number 73 for the special purpose of showing that shortcuts were possible. Seabreeze does the same and adds that the result would be the same even if they crossed the square, but gives no proof of this. MM draws a diagram and says that number 9 is the house, as the diagram shows. I cannot see how it does so. 
old cat assumes that the house must be number nine or number seventy three she does not explain how she estimates the distances b s arithmetic is faulty she makes the square root of one hundred sixty nine plus the square root of four hundred forty two plus the square root of one hundred and thirty equal seven hundred forty one i suppose you mean the square root of seven hundred forty one which would be a little nearer the truth but roots cannot be added in this manner do you think square root of nine plus square root of sixteen is twenty five or even square root of twenty five but iris state is more perilous still she draws illogical conclusions with a frightful calmness after pointing out rightly that a c is less than b d she says therefore the nearest house to the other three must be a or c and again after pointing out rightly that b and d are both within the half square containing a she says therefore a b plus a d must be less than b c plus c d there is no logical force in either therefore for the first try numbers one twenty one sixty seventy this will make your premise true and your conclusion false similarly for the second try numbers one thirty fifty one seventy one of the five partly right solutions rags and tatters and mad hatter who send one answer between them make number twenty five six units from the corner instead of five Cheem, E. R. D. L. and Maggie Potts leave openings at the corners of the square, which are not in the data. Moreover, Cheem gives values for the distances without any hint that they are only approximations. Crofi and Mofi make the bold and unfounded assumption that there were really twenty-one houses on each side instead of twenty, as stated by Balbus. We may assume, they add that the doors of numbers twenty one forty two sixty three eighty four are invisible from the centre of the square what is it there i wonder that crofi and mofi would not assume of the five who are wholly right i think bradshaw of the future caius clifton c and Martreb deserve special praise for the full analytical solutions mathematics picks out number nine and proves it to be the right house in two ways very neatly and ingenuously but why he picks it out does not appear it is an excellent synthetical proof but lacks the analysis which the other four supply class list first bradshaw of the future caius clifton c martrap second mathematics third cheem crofi and mofi E. R. D. L. Maggie Potts, Rags and Tatters, and Matt Hatter. A remonstrance has reached me from Scrutator on the subject of not one, which he declares was no problem at all. Two questions, he says, are put. To solve one, there is no data, the other answers itself. As to the first point, Scrutator is mistaken. There are not ease data sufficient to answer the question as to the other it is interesting to know that the question answers itself and i am sure it does the question great credit still i fear i cannot enter it on the list of winners as this competition is only open to human beings end of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avayi in October two thousand and nine. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter thirteen. Answers to Not Three. Problem. One. Two travellers, starting at the same time, went opposite ways round a circular railway. Trains start each way every 15 minutes, the easterly ones going round in three hours, the westerly in two. How many trains did each meet on the way, not counting trains met at the terminus itself? 2. They went round as before, each traveller counting as 1 the train containing the other traveller. How many did each meet? 
answers one nineteen two the easterly traveller met twelve the other eight the trains one way took one hundred and eighty minutes the other way one hundred and twenty let us take the least common multiple three hundred and sixty and divide the railway into three hundred sixty units then one set of trains went at the rate of two units a minute and at intervals of thirty units the other at the rate of three units a minute and at intervals of forty five units an easterly train starting has forty five units between it and the first train it will meet it does two fifths of this while the other does three fifths and thus meets it at the end of eighteen units and so all the way round a westerly train starting has thirty units between it and the first train it will meet it does three fifths of this while the other does two fifths and thus meets it at the end of eighteen units and so all the way round hence if the railway be divided by nineteen posts into twenty parts each containing eighteen units trains meet at every post and in one each traveller passes nineteen posts in going round and so meets nineteen trains but in two the easterly traveller only begins to count after traversing two-fifths of the journey that is on reaching the eighth post and so counts twelve posts similarly the other counts eight they meet at the end of two-fifths of three hours or three-fifths of two hours that is seventy-two minutes forty-five answers have been received of these twelve are beyond the reach of discussion as they give no working i can but enumerate their names ardmore e a f a d l d mathematics m e t poo poo and the red queen are all wrong beta and rowena have got one right and two wrong cheeky bob and nairam give the right answers but it may perhaps make the one less cheeky and induce the other to take a less inverted view of things to be informed that if this had been a competition for a prize they would have got no marks nota bene i have not ventured to put e a s name in full as she only gave it provisionally in case her answer should prove right of the thirty-three answers for which the working is given ten are wrong eleven half wrong and half right three right except that they cherished the delusion that it was clara who travelled in the easterly train a point which the data do not enable us to settle and nine wholly right the ten wrong answers are from boo peep financier i w t kate b m a h q y z seagull thistledown tom quad and an unsigned one boo peep rightly says that the easterly traveller met all trains which started during the three hours of her trip as well as all which started during the previous two hours that is all which started at the commencements of twenty periods of fifteen minutes each and she is right in striking out the one she met at the moment of starting but wrong in striking out the last train for she did not meet this at the terminus but fifteen minutes before she got there she makes the same mistake in two financier thinks that any train met for the second time is not to be counted i w t finds by a process which is not stated that the travellers met at the end of seventy one minutes and twenty six and a half seconds kate b thinks the trains which are met on starting and on arriving are never to be counted even when met elsewhere q y z tries a rather complex algebraical solution and succeeds in finding the time of meeting correctly all else is wrong seagull seems to think that in one the easterly train stood still for three hours and says that in two the travellers met at the end of seventy one minutes forty seconds thistledown nobly confesses to having tried no calculation but merely having drawn a picture of the railway and counted the trains in one she counts wrong in two she makes them meet in seventy five minutes tom quad omits one in two he makes clara count the train she met on her arrival the unsigned one is also unintelligible 
It states that the travelers go one twenty-fourth more than the total distance to be traversed. The Clara theory, already referred to, is adopted by five of these, that is, Boo Peep, Financier, Kate B., Tom Quad, and the nameless writer. The eleven half-right answers are from Bog Oak, Bridget, Castor, Cheshire Cat, G. E. B., Guy, Mary, M. A. H., Old Maid, R. W., and Vendredi. All these adopt the Clara theory. Castor omits one. Vendredi gets one right, but in two makes the same mistake as Boo Peep. I notice in your solution a marvelous proportion sum. Three hundred miles to two hours proportional to one mile to twenty-four seconds. May I venture to advise your acquiring as soon as possible an utter disbelief in the possibility of a ratio existing between miles and hours? Do not be disheartened by your two friends' sarcastic remarks on your roundabout ways. Their short method of adding twelve and eight has the slight disadvantage of bringing the answer wrong. Even a roundabout method is better than that. M-A-H in 2 makes the travelers count 1 after they met, not when they met. Cheshire Cat and Old Maid get 20 as answer for 1, by forgetting to strike out the train met on arrival. The others all get 18 in various ways. Bog Oak, Guy and R.W. divide the trains which the westerly traveler has to meet into two sets, that is, those already on the line, which they rightly make eleven, and those which started during her two hours' journey, exclusive of train met on arrival, which they wrongly make seven, and they make a similar mistake with the easterly train. Bridget, rightly, says that the westerly traveller met a train every six minutes for two hours, but wrongly makes the number twenty. It should be twenty-one. G.E.B. adopts Boo Peep's method, but wrongly strikes out, for the easterly traveller, the train which started at the commencement of the previous two hours. Mary thinks the train met on arrival must not be counted, even when met on a previous occasion. The three who are wholly right, but for the unfortunate Clara theory, are F. Lee, G.S.C. and X.A.B. And now descend, ye classic ten, who have solved the whole problem. Your names are Ailebain, Algernon Bray, thanks for a friendly remark, which comes with a hard warmth that not even the Atlantic could chill. Arvon, Bradshaw of the Future, Fifi, HLR, JLO, Omega, SSG, and Waiting for the Train. Several of these have put Clara provisionally into the easterly train, but they seem to have understood that the data do not decide that point. Class list. First, Aile Bain, Algernon Bray, Bradshaw of the Future, Fifi, HLR, Omega, SSG, Waiting for the Train. Second, Arvon, J. L. O. Third, F. Lee, G. S. C. X. A. B. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 14 Answers to Not 4 Problem There are five sacks, of which numbers 1, 2 weigh 12 pounds, numbers 2, 3, 13 and a half pounds, numbers 3, 4, 11 and a half pounds, numbers 4, 5, 8 pounds, Numbers 1, 3, 5, 16 pounds. Required the weight of each sack. Answer. 
The sum of all the weighings, 61 pounds, includes sack number 3 thrice and each other twice. Deducting twice the sum of the first and fourth weighings, we get 21 pounds for thrice number 3, that is, 7 pounds for number 3. Hence, the second and third weighings give 6.5 pounds, 4.5 pounds for numbers 2, 4, and hence again, the first and fourth weighings give 5.5 pounds, 3.5 pounds for numbers 1, 5. 97 answers have been received. Of these, 15 are beyond the reach of discussion, as they give no working. I can but enumerate their names, and I take this opportunity of saying that this is the last time I shall put on record the names of competitors who give no sort of clue to the process by which their answers were obtained. In guessing a conundrum, or in catching a flea, we do not expect a breathless victor to give us afterwards, in cold blood, a history of the mental or muscular efforts by which he achieved success, but a mathematical calculation is another thing. The names of this mute inglorious band are Common Sense, D.E.R., Douglas, E.L., Ellen, I.M.T., J.M.C., Joseph, Not One, Lucy, Meek, M.F.C., Pyramus, Shah, Veritas. Of the 82 answers with which the working or some approach to it is supplied, one is wrong. 17 have given solutions which are, from one cause or another, practically valueless. The remaining 64 I shall try to arrange in a class list, according to the varying degrees of shortness and neatness to which they seem to have attained. The solitary wrong answer is from Nell. To be thus alone in the crowd is a distinction, a painful one, no doubt, but still a distinction. I am sorry for you, my dear young lady, and I seem to hear your tearful exclamation when you read these lines. Ah, this is the knell of all my hopes. Why, oh why, did you assume that the fourth and fifth bags weighed four pounds each? And why did you not test your answers? However, please try again, and please don't change your nom de plume. Let us have Nell in the first class next time. The 17 whose solutions are practically valueless are Ardmore, a ready reckoner, Arthur, Bog Lark, Bog Oak, Bridget, first attempt, JLC, MET, Rose, Rovina, Seabreeze, Sylvia, Thistledown, Three Fifths Asleep, Vendredi, and Winifred. Boglark tries it by a sort of rule of false, assuming experimentally that numbers 1, 2 weigh 6 pounds each, and having thus produced 17 and a half instead of 16 as the weight of 1, 3 and 5, she removes the superfluous pound and a half, but does not explain how she knows from which to take it. Three-fifths asleep says that, when in that peculiar state, it seems perfectly clear to her that, Three out of the five sacks being weighed twice over, two-fifths of forty-five equals twenty-seven, must be the total weight of the five sacks. As to which I can only say with the captain, It beats me entirely. Winifred, on the plea that one must have a starting point, assumes, what I fear is a mere guess, that number one weighed five and a half pounds. The rest all do it, wholly or partly, by guesswork. The problem is, of course, as any algebraist sees at once, a case of simultaneous simple equations. It is, however, easily soluble by arithmetic only, and when this is the case, I hold that it is bad workmanship to use the more complex method. I have not, this time, given more credit to arithmetical solutions, but in future problems I shall, other things being equal, give the highest marks to those who use the simplest machinery. I have put into class 1 those whose answers seemed specially short and neat, and into class 3 those that seemed specially long or clumsy. Of this last set, ACM, Fursbush, James, Partridge, RW, and Waiting for the Train have sent long wandering solutions, the substitutions having no definite method, but seeming to have been made to see what would come of it. Chilpome and Dublin Boy omit some of the working. 
Arvon Marlborough boy only finds the weight of one sack. Class list. First. B. E. D. C. H. Constance Johnson. Greystead. Guy. Hoopo. J. F. A. M. A. H. Number 5. Pedro. R. E. X. Seven old men. Vis inertiae. Willie B. Yahoo. Second, American subscriber, an appreciative schoolman, Ayer, Bradshaw of the future, Cheem, CMG, Dynamite, Duckwing, ECM, E.N. Lowry, Ira, Euroclydon, FHW, Fifi, GEB, Harlequin, Hawthorne, Hugh Green, JAB, Jack Tarr, JBB, Kukovjny, Landlubber, LD, Magpie, Mary, Mruxi, Mini, Money Spinner, Nairam, Old Cat, Polychinel, Simple Susan, SSG, Thisp, Verena, Wamba, Wolf, Wycamicus, YMAH. Third, ACM. Arvon Marlborough Boy, Chilpom, Dublin Boy, Furzbush, James, Partridge, R.W., Waiting for the Train. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 15 Answers to Knot 5 Problem To mark pictures, giving three crosses to two or three, two to four or five, and one to nine or ten. Also giving three odds to one or two, two to three or four, and one to eight or nine, so as to mark the smallest possible number of pictures, and to give them the largest possible number of marks. Answer. Ten pictures, twenty-nine marks. Arranged thus in a three by ten matrix. The first row has crosses in the first nine columns, and an odd in the tenth column. The second row has crosses in the first five columns, an empty entry in the sixth column, and odds in columns 7 to 10. The third row has crosses in the first two columns, and odds in the last eight columns. Solution. By giving all the crosses possible, putting into brackets the optional ones, we get 10 pictures marked thus in a 3 by 10 matrix. The first row has crosses in all columns, the cross in the last column is put in brackets. The second row has crosses in the first five columns, the last cross is put in brackets, and the columns 6 to 10 are empty. The third row has crosses in the first three columns, the last cross is put in brackets, and the columns 4 to 10 are empty. By then assigning odds in the same way, beginning at the other end, we get 9 pictures marked thus in a 3 by 9 matrix. The first row starts with seven empty columns, has an odd put in brackets in the eighth column and an odd in the ninth column. The second row starts with five empty columns, has an odd put in brackets in the sixth column and odds in columns seven to nine. The third row has nine odds, the odd in the first column is put in brackets. All we have now to do is to run these two wedges as close together as they will go, so as to get the minimum number of pictures erasing optional marks where by so doing we can run them closer, but otherwise letting them stand. There are ten necessary marks in the first row and in the third, but only seven in the second. Hence, we erase all optional marks in the first and third rows, but let them stand in the second. Twenty-two answers have been received. Of these, eleven give no working, so, in accordance with what I announced in my last review of answers, I leave them unnamed, merely mentioning that five are right and six wrong. Of the eleven answers with which some working is supplied, three are wrong. 
ch begins with the rash assertion that under the given conditions the sum is impossible for he or she adds these initialed correspondents are dismally vague beings to deal with perhaps it would be a better pronoun ten is the least possible number of pictures granted therefore we must either give two crosses to six or two odds to five why must o oh alphabetical phantom it is nowhere ordained that every picture must have three marks fifi sends a folio page of solution which deserved a better fate she offers three answers in each of which ten pictures are marked with thirty marks in one she gives two crosses to six pictures in another to seven in the third she gives two odds to five thus in every case ignoring the conditions I pause to remark that the condition two crosses to four or five pictures can only mean either to four or else to five. If, as one competitor holds, it might mean any number not less than four, the words or five would be superfluous. IEA, I am happy to say that none of these bloodless phantoms appear this time in the class list. Is it idea with a D left out? gives two crosses to six pictures she then takes me to task for using the word ought instead of not no doubt to one who thus rebels against the rules laid down for her guidance the word must be distasteful but does not iea remember the parallel case of adder that creature was originally a nadder then the two words took to bandying the poor n backwards and forwards like a shuttlecock the final state of the game being an ether may not a naught have similar become an odd anyhow odds and crosses is a very old game i don't think i ever heard it called noughts and crosses in the following class list i hope the solitary occupant of three will sheath her claws when she hears how narrow an escape she has had of not being named at all her account of the process by which she got the answer is so meagre that like the nursery tale of jack a minery i trust i e a will be merciful to the spelling it is scarcely to be distinguished from zero class list first guy old cat sea breeze second ayr bradshaw of the future f lee h vernon third cat end of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October two thousand and nine. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Sixteen. Answers to Not Six. Problem One. A and B began the year with only one thousand pounds apiece. They borrowed not. They stole not. On the next New Year's Day, they had £60,000 between them. How did they do it? Solution. They went that day to the Bank of England. A stood in front of it, while B went round and stood behind it. Two answers have been received, both worthy of much honour. Edelpate makes them borrow zero and steal zero, and uses both ciphers by putting them at the right-hand end of the £1,000, thus producing £100,000, which is well over the mark. But, or to express it in Latin, at spes infracta has solved it even more ingenuously. With the first cipher she turns the 1 of the £1,000 into a 9, and adds the results to the original sum, thus getting £10,000. And in this, by means of the other zero, she turns the one into a six, thus hitting the exact sixty thousand pounds. Class list. First, ad spes infracta. Second, Adelpate. Problem two. L makes five scarves, while M makes two. Z makes four, while L makes three. Five scarves of Z's weigh one of L's. Five of M's weigh three of Z's. One of M's is as warm as four of Z's, and one of L's as warm as three of M's. Which is best, 
giving equal weight in the result to rapidity of work, lightness, and warmth. Answer. The order is M, L, Z. Solution. As to rapidity, other things being constant, L's merit is to M's in the ratio of 5 to 2, Z's to L's in the ratio of 4 to 3. In order to get one set of three numbers fulfilling these conditions, it is perhaps simplest to take the one that occurs twice as unity and reduce the others to fractions. This gives, for L, M, and Z, the marks 1, 2 fifths, 2 thirds. In estimating for lightness, we observe that the greater the weight, the less the merit, so that Z's merit is to L's as 5 to 1. Thus the marks for lightness are 1 fifth, 2 thirds, 1. And similarly, the marks for warmth are 3, 1, 1 fourth. To get the total result, we must multiply L's three marks together and do the same for M and for Z. The final numbers are 1 times 1 fifth times 3, 2 fifths times 2 thirds times 1, 2 thirds times 1 times 1 quarter, that is, 3 fifths, 2 thirds, 1 third, that is, multiplying throughout by 15, which will not alter the proportion, 9, 10, 5, showing the order of merit to be M, L, Z. 29 answers have been received, of which 5 are right and 24 wrong. These hapless ones have all, with three exceptions, fallen into the error of adding the proportional numbers together for each candidate instead of multiplying. Why the latter is right rather than the former is fully proved in textbooks, so I will not occupy space by stating it here. But it can be illustrated very easily by the case of length, breadth and depth. Suppose A and B are rival diggers of rectangular tanks. The amount of work done is evidently measured by the number of cubical feet dug out. Let A dig a tank, 10 feet long, 10 wide, 2 deep. Let B dig one, 6 feet long, 5 wide, 10 deep. The cubical contents are 200, 300, that is, B is best digger in the ratio of 3 to 2. Now try marking for length, width and depth separately, giving a maximum mark of 10 to the best in each contest, and then adding the results. Of the 24 malefactors, one gives no working, and so has no real claim to be named, but I break the rule for once, in deference to its success in problem 1, he, she or it is Edelpate. The other 23 may be divided into 5 groups. First and worst are, I take it, those who put the rightful winner last, arranging them as Lolo, Zuzu, Mimi. The names of these desperate wrongdoers are Ayr, Bradshaw of the Future, Furzbush and Pollux, who send a joint answer, Greystead, Guy, Old Hen and Simple Susan. The latter was once best of all, the old hen has taken advantage of her simplicity and beguiled her with the chaff which was the bane of her own chickenhood. Secondly, I point the finger of scorn at those who have put the worst candidate at the top, arranging them as Zuzu, Mimi, Lolo. They are Grecia, MM, Old Cat, and REX. Tis Greece, but... The third set have avoided both these enormities and have even succeeded in putting the worst last, their answer being Lolo, Mimi, Zuzu. Their names are Ayer, who also appears among the quite tutu, Clifton C., F.B., Fifi, Grig, Janet, and Mrs. Seri Gamp. F.B. has not fallen into the common error. She multiplies together the proportionate numbers she gets, but in getting them she goes wrong by reckoning warmth as a demerit. Possibly she is freshly burned or comes from Bombay. Janet and Miss Seri Gamp have also avoided this error. The method they have adopted is shrouded in mystery. I scarcely feel competent to criticize it. Mrs. Gamp says, If Zuzu makes four while Lola makes three, Zuzu makes six while Lola makes five, bad reasoning, while Mimi makes two. From this she concludes, Therefore Zuzu excels in speed by one. That is, when compared with Lolo, but what about Mimi? She then compares the three kinds of excellence measured on this mystic scale. Janet takes the statement that 
Lolo makes five while Mimi makes two to prove that Lolo makes three while Mimi makes one and Zuzu four. Worse reasoning than Mrs. Gamp's and thence concludes that Zuzu excels in speed by one eighth. Janet should have been Adeline, mystery of mysteries. The fourth set actually put Mimi at the top, arranging them as Mimi, Zuzu, Lolo. They are Marquis and Co., Martrap, SBB, first initials scarcely legible, may be meant for J, and Stanza. The fifth set consists of an ancient fish and camel. These ill-assorted comrades, by dint of foot and fin, have scrambled into the right answer, but, as their method is wrong, of course it counts for nothing. Also, an ancient fish has very ancient and fish-like ideas as to how numbers represent merit. She says, Lolo gains two and a half on Mimi. Two and a half what? Fish, fish, art thou in thy duty? Of the five winners, I put Balbus and the elder traveller slightly below the other three. Balbus for defective reasoning, the other for scanty working. Balbus gives two reasons for saying that addition of marks is not the right method, and then adds, it follows that the decision must be made by multiplying the marks together. This is hardly more logical than to say, this is not spring, therefore it must be autumn. Class list. First, Dynamite, EBDL, Joram. Second, Balbus, the Elder Traveller. With regard to Knot 5, I beg to express to Vis Inertiae and to any others who, like her, understood the condition to be that every marked picture must have three marks, my sincere regret that the unfortunate phrase, fill the columns with odds and crosses, should have caused them to waste so much time and trouble. I can only repeat that a literal interpretation of fill would seem to me to require that every picture in the gallery should be marked. This inertia would have been in the first class if she had sent in the solution she now offers. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of A Tangled Tale – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avayi in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 17. Answers to Knot 7. Problem. Given that one glass of lemonade, three sandwiches and seven biscuits cost one and two pence, and that one glass of lemonade, four sandwiches and ten biscuits cost one and five pence, find the cost of one a glass of lemonade, a sandwich, and a biscuit, and two, two glasses of lemonade, three sandwiches, and five biscuits. Answer. One, eight pence. Two, one and seven pence. Solution. This is best treated algebraically. Let x equal the cost in pence of a glass of lemonade, y of a sandwich and z of a biscuit. Then we have x plus 3y plus 7z equals 14 and x plus 4y plus 10z equals 17. And we require the values of x plus y plus z and of 2x plus 3y plus 5z. Now, from two equations only we cannot find separately the values of three unknowns, Certain combinations of them may, however, be found. Also we know that we can, by the help of the given equations, eliminate two of the three unknowns from the quantity whose value is required, which will then contain one only. If, then, the required value is ascertainable at all, it can only be by the third unknown vanishing of itself, otherwise the problem is impossible. Let us then eliminate lemonade and sandwiches and reduce everything to biscuits, a state of things even more depressing than if all the world were apple pie, by subtracting the first equation from the second, which eliminates lemonade and gives y plus 3z equals 3, or y equals 3 minus 3z, and then substituting this value of y in the first, which gives x minus 2z equals 5, that is, 
x equals 5 plus 2z. Now if we substitute these values of x, y in the quantities whose values are required, the first becomes the quantity 5 plus 2z plus the quantity 3 minus 3z plus z, that is 8, and the second becomes 2 times the quantity 5 plus 2z plus 3 times the quantity 3 minus 3z plus 5z, that is 19. Hence the answers are 1, 8 pence, 2, 1 and 7 pence. The above is a universal method, that is, it is absolutely certain either to produce the answer or to prove that no answer is possible. The question may also be solved by combining the quantities whose values are given so as to form those whose values are required. This is merely a matter of ingenuity and good luck, and as it may fail, even when the thing is possible and is of no use in proving it impossible, I cannot rank this method as equal in value with the other. Even when it succeeds, it may prove a very tedious process. Suppose the 26 competitors who have sent in what I may call accidental solutions had had a question to deal with where every number contained 8 or 10 digits. I suspect it would have been a case of silvered is the raven hair, see patience, before any solution would have been hit on by the most ingenious of them. 45 answers have come in, of which 44 give, I am happy to say, some sort of working, and therefore deserve to be mentioned by name, and to have their virtues, or vices as the case may be, discussed. 13 have made assumptions to which they have no right, and so cannot figure in the class list, even though, in 10 of the 13 cases, the answer is right. Of the remaining 28, no less than 26 have sent in accidental solutions, and therefore fall short of the highest honours. I will now discuss individual cases, taking the worst first, as my custom is. Froggy gives no working, at least this is all he gives. After stating the given equations, he says, therefore the difference, one sandwich plus three biscuits, equals three pence then follow the amounts of the unknown bills, with no further hint as to how he got them. Froggy has had a very narrow escape of not being named at all. Of those who are wrong, Vis Inertiae has sent in a piece of incorrect working. Peruse the horrid details and shudder. She takes X, call it Y, as the cost of a sandwich, and concludes, rightly enough, that a biscuit will cost the quantity 3 minus y over 3. She then subtracts the second equation from the first and deduces 3y plus 7 times the quantity 3 minus y over 3 minus 4y plus 10 times the quantity 3 minus y divided by 3 equals 3. By making two mistakes in this line, she brings out y equals 2 over 2. Try it again, O vis inertiae. Away with inertia, infuse a little more vis, and you will bring out the correct, though uninteresting, result 0 equals 0. This will show you that it is hopeless to try to coax any one of these three unknowns to reveal its separate value. The other competitor who is wrong throughout is either JMC or TMC, but whether he be a juvenile miscalculator or a true mathematician confused, he makes the answers 7 pence and 1 and 5 pence. He assumes, with too much confidence, that biscuits were half a penny each, and that Clara paid for 8, though she only ate 7. We will now consider the 13 whose working is wrong, though the answer is right. And, not to measure their demerits too exactly, I will take them in alphabetical order. Anita finds, rightly, that one sandwich and three biscuits cost three pence, and proceeds, therefore, one sandwich equals one and a half pence, three biscuits equals one and a half pence, one lemonade equals six pence. Dynamite begins like Anita, and thence proves, rightly, that a biscuit costs less than a penny, whence she concludes, wrongly, that it must cost half a penny. FCW is so beautifully resigned to the certainty of a verdict of guilty that I have hardly the heart to utter the word, without adding a recommended to mercy owing to extenuating circumstances. 
But really, you know, where are the extenuating circumstances? She begins by assuming that lemonade is four pence a glass, and sandwiches three pence each, making with the two given equations four conditions to be fulfilled by three miserable unknowns. And, having, naturally, developed this into a contradiction, she then tries five pence and two pence with a similar result. Nota bene, this process might have been carried on through the whole of the tertiary period, without gratifying one single megatherium. She then, by a happy thought, tries half-penny biscuits, and so obtains a consistent result. This may be a good solution, viewing the problem as a conundrum, but it is not scientific. Janet identifies sandwiches with biscuits. One sandwich plus three biscuits she makes equal to four. For what? Mayfair makes the astounding assertion that the equation s plus 3b equals 3 is evidently only satisfied by s equals 2 halves, b equals 1 half. Old Cat believes that the assumption that a sandwich costs one and a half pence is the only way to avoid unmanageable fractions. But why avoid them? Is there not a certain glow of triumph in taming such a fraction? Ladies and gentlemen, the fraction now before you is one that for years defied all efforts of a refining nature. It was, in a word, hopelessly vulgar. Treating it as a circulating decimal, the treadmill of fractions, only made matters worse. As a last resource, I reduced it to its lowest terms and extracted its square root. Joking apart, let me thank Old Cat for some very kind words of sympathy in reference to a correspondent, whose name I am happy to say I have now forgotten, who had found fault with me as a discourteous critic. OVL is beyond my comprehension. He takes the given equations as 1 and 2, thence, by the process 2 minus 1, deduces, rightly, equation 3, that is, s plus 3b equals 3, and thence again, by the process times 3, a hopeless mystery, deduces 3s plus 4b equals 4. I have nothing to say about it. I give it up. Seabreeze says, it is immaterial to the answer. Why? In what proportion 3 pence is divided between the sandwich and the 3 biscuits? So she assumes s equals 1.5 pence, b equals half a penny. Stanza is one of a very irregular metre. At first, she, like Janet, identifies sandwiches with biscuits. She then tries two assumptions, s equals 1, b equals 2 thirds, and s equals 1 half, b equals 2 sixths, and naturally ends in contradictions. Then she returns to the first assumption and finds the three unknowns separately, quod est absurdum. Stiletto identifies sandwiches and biscuits as articles. Is the word ever used by confectioners? I fancied, what is the next article, ma'am, was limited to linen drapers. Two sisters first assume that biscuits are for a penny, and then that there are two a penny, adding that the answer will of course be the same in both cases. It is a dreamy remark, making one feel something like Macbeth grasping at the spectral dagger. Is this a statement that I see before me? If you were to say, we both walked the same way this morning, and I were to say, one of you walked the same way, but the other didn't, which of the three would be the most hopelessly confused? Turtle Piet, what is a Turtle Piet, please? And Old Crow, who sent a joint answer, and YY adopt the same method. YY gets the equation S plus 3B equals 3, and then says, this sum must be apportioned in one of the three following ways. It may be, I grant you, but why why do you say must? I fear it is possible for why why to be too wise. The other two conspirators are less positive. They say it can be so divided. But they add, either of the three prices being right. This is bad grammar and bad arithmetic at once, O mysterious birds. Of those who win honours, the Shetland snark must have the third class all to himself. He has only answered half the question, that is, the amount of Clara's luncheon, 
the two little old ladies he pitilessly leaves in the midst of their difficulty i beg to assure him with thanks for his friendly remarks that entrance fees and subscriptions are things unknown in that most economical of clubs the knot untires the authors of the twenty-six accidental solutions differ only in the number of steps they have taken between the data and the answers in order to do them full justice i have arranged a second class in sections according to the number of steps the two kings are fearfully deliberate i suppose walking quick or taking shortcuts is inconsistent with kingly dignity but really in reading thesea's solution one almost fancied he was marking time and making no advance at all the other king will i hope pardon me for having altered coal into coal king coilus or coil seems to have reigned soon after arthur's time henry of huntington identifies him with the king coel who first built walls round colster which was named after him in the chronicle of robert of gloucester we read after king Irirag, of one we have ye told, Marius' his son was king, quaint mon and bold, and his son was after him, Coil was his name, both it were quaint men and of noble fame. Balbus lays it down as a general principle that, in order to ascertain the cost of any one luncheon, it must come to the same amount upon two different assumptions query should not eat be we otherwise the luncheon is represented as wishing to ascertain its own cost he then makes two assumptions one that sandwiches cost nothing the other that biscuits cost nothing either arrangement would lead to the shop being inconveniently crowded and brings out the unknown luncheons as eight pence and nineteen pence on each assumption he then concludes that this agreement of results shows that the answers are correct. Now I propose to disprove his general law by simply giving one instance of its failing. One instance is quite enough. In logical language, in order to disprove a universal affirmative, it is enough to prove its contradictory, which is a particular negative. I must pause for a digression on logic, and especially on ladies' logic the universal affirmative everybody says he's a duck is crushed instantly by proving the particular negative peter says he's a goose which is equivalent to peter does not say he's a duck and the universal negative nobody calls on her is well met by the particular affirmative i called yesterday in short either of two contradictories disproves the other and the moral is that since a particular proposition is much more easily proved than a universal one it is the wisest course in arguing with a lady to limit one's own assertions to particulars and leave her to prove the universal contradictory if she can you will thus generally secure a logical victory a practical victory is not to be hoped for since she can always fall back upon the crushing remark that has nothing to do with it a move for which man has not yet discovered any satisfactory answer now let us return to balbus here is my particular negative on which to test his rule suppose the two recorded luncheons to have been two buns one queen cake two sausage rolls and a bottle of zoedon total one and nine pence and one bun two queen cakes a sausage roll and a bottle of zoedon total one and four pence and suppose clara's unknown luncheon to have been three buns one queen cake one sausage roll and two bottles of zoedon while the two little sisters had been indulging in eight buns four queen cakes two sausage rolls and six bottles of zoedon poor souls how thirsty they must have been if balbus will kindly try this by his principle of two assumptions first assuming that a bun is one penny and a queen cake two pence and then that a bun is three pence and a queen cake three pence he will bring out the other two luncheons on each assumption as one and nine pence and four and ten pence respectively which harmony of results he will say shows that the answers are correct and yet as a matter of fact the buns were two pence each the queen cakes three pence the sausage rolls six pence 
and a zoedon two pence a bottle so that clara's third luncheon had cost one and seven pence and her thirsty friends had spent four and four pence another remark of balbus i will quote and discuss for i think that it also may yield a moral for some of my readers he says it is the same thing in substance whether in solving this problem we use words and call it arithmetic or use letters and signs and call it algebra now this does not appear to me a correct description of the two methods the arithmetical method is that of synthesis only it goes from one known fact to another till it reaches its goal whereas the algebraical method is that of analysis it begins with the goal symbolically represented and so goes backwards dragging its veiled victim with it till it has reached the full daylight of known facts in which it can tear off the veil and say i know you take an illustration your house has been broken into and robbed and you appeal to the policeman who was on duty that night well mum i did see a chap getting out over your garden wall but i was a good bit off so i didn't chase him like i just cut down the short way to the checkers and who should i meet but bill sykes coming full split round the corner so i just ups and says my lad you're wanted that's all i says and he says i'll go along quiet bobby he says without the darbies he says there's your arithmetical policeman now try the other method i seed somebody a running but he was well gone or ever i got nigh the place so i just took a look round in the garden and i noticed the footmarks where the chap had come right across your flower beds there was good big footmarks surely and i noticed as the left foot went down the hill ever so much deeper than the other and i says to myself the chap's been a big hulking chap and he goes lame on his left foot and i rubs my hand on the wall where he got over and there was soot on it and no mistake so i says to myself now where can i light on a big man in the chimbley sweep line what's lame of one foot and i flashes up promiscuous and i says it's bill sykes says i there is your algebraical policeman a higher intellectual type to my thinking than the other little jack's solution calls for a word of praise as he has written out what really is an algebraical proof in words without representing any of his facts as equations if it is all his own he will make a good algebraist in the time to come i beg to thank simple susan for some kind words of sympathy to the same effect as those received from old cat hecla and martrab are the only two who have used the method certain either to produce the answer or else to prove it impossible so they must share between them the highest honors class list first hecla martrab second paragraph one two steps adelaide clifton c e k c guy l'inconnu little jack nil desperandum simple susan yellow hammer woolly one paragraph two three steps a a a christmas carol afternoon tea an appreciative school ma'am baby balbus bog oak the red queen wallflower paragraph three four steps hawthorne joram s s g paragraph four five steps a stepney coach paragraph five six steps bay laurel bradshaw of the future paragraph six nine steps old king cole paragraph seven fourteen steps theseus answers to correspondence i have received several letters on the subjects of knots two and six which led me to think some further explanation desirable in knot two i had intended the numbering of the houses to begin at one corner of the square and this was assumed by most if not all of the competitors trojanus however says assuming in default of any information that the street enters the square in the middle of each side it may be supposed that the numbering begins at a street but surely the other is the more natural assumption in knot six the first problem was of course a mere jeu de mots whose presence i thought excusable in a series of problems whose aim is to entertain rather than to instruct
but it has not escaped the contemptuous criticisms of two of my correspondents, who seem to think that Apollo is in duty bound to keep his bow always on the stretch. Neither of them has guessed it, and this is true human nature. Only the other day, the 31st of September to be quite exact, I met my old friend Brown and gave him a riddle I had just heard. With one great effort of his colossal mind, Brown guessed it. Right, said I. Ah, said he, it's very neat, very neat. And it isn't an answer that would occur to everybody. Very neat indeed. A few yards further on, I fell in with Smith, and to him I propounded the same riddle. He frowned over it for a minute, and then gave it up. Meekly I faltered out the answer. A poor thing, sir, Smith growled as he turned away. A very poor thing. I wonder you care to repeat such rubbish. Yet Smith's mind is, if possible, even more colossal than Brown's. The second problem of knot six is an example in ordinary double rule of three, whose essential feature is that the result depends on the variation of several elements, which are so related to it that, if all but one be constant, it varies as that one. Hence, if none be constant, it varies as their product. Thus, for example, the cubical contents of a rectangular tank vary as its length, if breadth and depth be constant, and so on. Hence, if none be constant, it varies as the product of the length, breadth, and depth. When the result is not thus connected with the varying elements, the problem ceases to be double rule of three and often becomes one of great complexity. To illustrate this, let us take two candidates for a prize, A and B, who are to compete in French, German, and Italian. A. Let it be laid down that the result is to depend on their relative knowledge of each subject, so that, whether their marks for French be 1, 2, or 100, 200, the result will be the same. And let it also be laid down that, if they get equal marks on two papers, the final marks are to have the same ratio as those of the third paper. This is a case of ordinary double rule of three. We multiply A's three marks together and do the same for B. Note that if A gets a single zero, his final mark is zero, even if he gets full marks for two papers, while B gets only one mark for each paper. This of course would be very unfair on A, though a correct solution under the given conditions. B. The result is to depend, as before, on relative knowledge but French is to have twice as much weight as German or Italian. This is an unusual form of question. I should be inclined to say, the resulting ratio is to be nearer to the French ratio than if we multiplied as in A, and so much nearer that it would be necessary to use the other multipliers twice to produce the same result as in A. That is, if the French ratio were two-tenths and the others two-ninths, one-ninth, so that the ultimate ratio by method A would be 2 over 45, I should multiply instead by 2 thirds, 1 third, giving the result, 1 third which is nearer to 2 tenths than if he had used method A. C. The result is to depend on actual amount of knowledge of the three subjects collectively. Here we have to ask two questions. 1. What is to be the unit? that is, a standard to measure by, in each subject. 2. Are these units to be of equal or unequal value? The usual unit is the knowledge shown by answering the whole paper correctly, calling this 100. All lower amounts are represented by numbers between 0 and 100. Then, if these units are to be of equal value, we simply add A's three marks together and do the same for B. D. The conditions are the same as C, but French is to have double weight. Here we simply double the French marks and add as before. E. French is to have such weight that, if other marks be equal, the ultimate ratio is to be that of the French paper, so that a zero in this would swamp the candidate, but the other two subjects are only to affect the result collectively, by the amount of knowledge shown, the two being reckoned of equal value. Here I should add 
A's German and Italian marks together, and multiply by his French mark. But I need not go on. The problem may evidently be set with many varying conditions, each requiring its own method of solution. The problem in knot 6 was meant to belong to variety A, and to make this clear I inserted the following passage. Usually the competitors differ in one point only. Thus, last year, Fifi and Gogo made the same number of scarves in the trial week, and they were equally light, but Fifi's were twice as warm as Gogo's, and she was pronounced twice as good. What I have said will suffice, I hope, as an answer to Balbus, who holds that A and C are the only possible varieties of the problem, and that to say, we cannot use addition, therefore we must be intended to use multiplication, is no more illogical than from knowledge that one was not born in the night to infer that he was born in the daytime. And also to Fifi, who says, I think a little more consideration will show you that our error of adding the proportional numbers together for each candidate instead of multiplying is no error at all. Why, even if addition had been the right method to use, not one of the writers, I speak from memory, showed any consciousness of the necessity of fixing a unit for each subject. No error at all. They were positively steeped in error. One correspondent, I do not name him as the communication is not quite friendly in tone, writes thus, I wish to add, very respectfully, that I think it would be in better taste if you were to abstain from the very trenchant expressions which you are accustomed to indulge in when criticizing the answer. That such a tone must not be, be not, agreeable to the persons concerned who have made mistakes, may possibly have no great weight with you, but I hope you will feel that it would be as well not to employ it, unless you are quite certain of being correct yourself. The only instances the writer gives of the trenchant expressions are hapless and malefactors. I beg to assure him, and any others who may need the assurance, I trust there are none, that all such words have been used in jest, and with no idea that they could possibly annoy anyone, and that I sincerely regret any annoyance I may have thus inadvertently given. May I hope that in future they will recognize the distinction between severe language used in sober earnest and the words of unmeant bitterness, which Coleridge has alluded to in that lovely passage beginning, A little child, a limber elf. If the writer will refer to that passage or to the preface to Fire, Famine and Slaughter, he will find a distinction for which I plead far better drawn out than I could hope to do in any words of mine. The writer's insinuation that I care not how much annoyance I give to my readers, I think it best to pass over in silence, but to his concluding remark I must entirely demur. I hold that to use language likely to annoy any of my correspondents would not be in the least justified by the plea that I was quite certain of being correct. I trust that the knot untires and I are not on such terms as those. I beg to thank G.B. for the offer of a puzzle, which, however, is too like the old one, make four nines into one hundred. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of A Tangled Tale – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll – Chapter 18 Answers to Knot 8 Paragraph 1 – The Pigs Problem Place twenty-four pigs in four styes so that, as you go round and round, you may always find the number in each sty nearer to ten than the number in the last. Answer. Place eight pigs in the first sty, ten in the second, nothing in the third, and six in the fourth. Ten is nearer ten than eight, nothing is nearer ten than ten, six is nearer ten than nothing, and 8 is nearer 10 than 6. This problem is noticed by only two correspondents. 
Balbus says, it certainly cannot be solved mathematically, nor do I see how to solve it by any verbal quibble. Nolan's volens makes her radiancy change the direction of going round, and even then is obliged to add, the pigs must be carried in front of her. Paragraph 2. The Gramstiffs. Problem. Omnibuses start from a certain point, both ways, every 15 minutes. A traveller, starting on foot along with one of them, meets one in twelve and a half minutes. When will he be overtaken by one? Answer. In six minutes one quarter. Solution. Let A be the distance an omnibus goes in fifteen minutes, and X the distance from the starting point to where the traveller is overtaken. Since the omnibus met is due at the starting point in two and a half minutes, it goes in that time as far as the traveller walks in twelve and a half, that is, it goes five times as fast. Now the overtaking omnibus is A behind the traveller when he starts, and therefore goes A plus X, while he goes X. Hence A plus X equals 5X, that is, 4X equals A, and X equals A over 4. This distance would be traversed by an omnibus in 15 over 4 minutes, and therefore by the traveller in 5 times 15 over 4. Hence he is overtaken in 18 minutes 3 quarters after starting, that is, in 6 minutes 1 quarter after meeting the omnibus. Four answers have been received, of which two are wrong. Dynamite rightly states that the overtaking omnibus reached the point where they met the other omnibus five minutes after they left, but wrongly concludes that, going five times as fast, it would overtake them in another minute. The travellers are five minutes walk ahead of the omnibus and must walk one-fourth of this distance farther before the omnibus overtakes them, which will be one-fifth of the distance traversed by the omnibus in the same time. This will require one minute one quarter more. Nolan's Volans tries it by process like Achilles and the tortoise. He rightly states that when the overtaking omnibus leaves the gate, the travellers are one-fifth of A ahead, and that it will take the omnibus three minutes to traverse this distance, during which time the travellers, he tells us, go one-fifteenth of A, this should be one-twenty-fifth. The travellers being now one-fifteenth of A ahead, he concludes that the work remaining to be done is for the travellers to go one-sixtieth of A, while the omnibus goes one-twelfth. The principle is correct and might have been applied earlier. Class list, first, Balbus, Delta. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 19. Answers to Knot 9. Paragraph 1. The Buckets. Problem. Lardner states that a solid, immersed in a fluid, displaces an amount equal to itself in bulk. How can this be true of a small bucket floating in a larger one? Solution. Lardner means by these places, occupies a space which might be filled with water without any change in the surroundings. If the portion of the floating bucket which is above the water could be annihilated, and the rest of it transformed into water, the surrounding water would not change its position, which agrees with Lardner's statement. Five answers have been received, none of which explains the difficulty arising from the well-known fact that a floating body is the same weight as the displaced fluid. Heckler says that only that portion of the smaller bucket which descends below the original level of the water can be properly said to be immersed, and only an equal bulk of water is displaced. Hence, according to Heckler, a solid whose weight was equal to that of an equal bulk of water would not float till the whole of it was below the original level of the water, but, as a matter of fact, it would float as soon as it was all under water. 
Magpie says the fallacy is the assumption that one body can displace another from a place where it isn't, and that Lardner's assertion is incorrect, except when the containing vessel was originally full to the brim. But the question of floating depends on the present state of things, not on past history. Old King Cole takes the same view as Heckler. Tympanum and Vindex assume that displaced means raised above its original level and merely explain how it comes to pass that the water, so raised, is less in bulk than the immersed portion of bucket and thus land themselves, or rather set themselves floating, in the same boat as Heckler. I regret that there is no class list to publish for this problem. Paragraph 2. Balbus's Essay Problem Balbus states that if a certain solid be immersed in a certain vessel of water, the water will rise through a series of distances, two inches, one inch, half an inch, etc., which series has no end. He concludes that the water will rise without limit. Is this true? Solution No. This series can never reach four inches, since, however many terms we take, we are always short of four inches by an amount equal to the last term taken. Three answers have been received, but only two seem to me worthy of honors. Tympanum says that the statement about the stick is merely a blind to which the old answer may well be applied, solvitur ambulando, or rather mergendo. I trust Tympanum will not test this in his own person by taking the place of the man in Balbus's essay. He would infallibly be drowned. Old King Cole rightly points out that the series 2, 1, etc. is a decrease in geometrical progression, while Vindex rightly identifies the fallacy as that of Achilles and the Tortoise. Class list. First, Old King Cole, Vindex. Paragraph 3. The Garden. Problem. An oblong garden, half a yard longer than wide, consists entirely of a gravel walk, spirally arranged, a yard wide and 3,630 yards long. Find the dimension of the garden. Answer. 60, 60 and a half. Solution. The number of yards and fractions of a yard traversed in walking along a straight piece of walk is evidently the same as the number of square yards and fractions of a square yard contained in that piece of walk, and the distance traversed in passing through a square yard at a corner is evidently a yard. Hence the area of the garden is 3630 square yards, that is, if x be the width, x times the quantity x plus one half equals 3630. Solving this quadratic, we find x equals 60. Hence, the dimensions are 60, 60 and a half. Twelve answers have been received, seven right and five wrong. CGL, Nabob, Old Crow and Tympanum assume that the number of yards in the length of the path is equal to the number of square yards in the garden. This is true, but should have been proved. But each is guilty of darker deeds. CGL's working consists of dividing 3630 by 60. Whence came this divisor, O Siegel? Divination? Or was it a dream? I fear this solution is worth nothing. Old Crow's is shorter and so, if possible, worth rather less. He says the answer is at once seen to be 60 by 60 and a half. Nabob's calculation is short, but as rich as a Nabob in error. He says that the square root of 3630 multiplied by 2 equals the length plus the breadth. That is, 60.25 times 2 equals 120 and a half. His first assertion is only true of a square garden. His second is irrelevant, since 60.25 is not the square root of 3630. Nay, Bob, this will not do. Tympanum says that by extracting the square root of 3630, we get 60 yards with a remainder of 30 over 60, or half a yard, which we add so as to make the oblong 60 by 60 and a half. This is very terrible, but worse remains behind. Tympanum proceeds thus, but why should there be the half-yard at all? 
because without it there would be no space at all for flowers. By means of it, we find reserved in the very center a small plot of ground, two yards long by half a yard wide, the only space not occupied by walk. But Bell was expressly said that the walk used up the whole of the area. Oh, tympanum, my tympa is exhausted, my brain is numb. I can say no more. Heckler indulges again and again in that most fatal of all habits in computation, the making two mistakes which cancel each other. She takes x as the width of the garden in yards, and x plus one half as its length, and makes her first coil the sum of x and a half, x and a half, x minus one, x minus one, that is four x minus three, but the fourth term should be x minus one and a half, so that her first coil is half a yard too long. Her second coil is the sum of x minus two and a half, x minus two and a half, x minus three, x minus three. Here the first term should be x minus two, and the last x minus three and a half. These two mistakes cancel, and this coil is therefore right. And the same thing is true of every other coil but the last, which needs an extra half yard to reach the end of the path, and this exactly balances the mistake in the first coil. Thus, the sum total of the coils comes right, though the working is all wrong. Of the seven who are right, Dynamite, Janet, Magpie, and Taffy make the same assumption as CGL and Co. They then solve by a quadratic. Magpie also tries it by arithmetical progression, but fails to notice that the first and last coils have special values. Alumnus Etone attempts to prove what CGL assumes by a particular instance, taking a garden six by five and a half. He ought to have proved that generally what is true of one number is not always true of others. Old King Cole solves it by an arithmetical progression. It is right, but too lengthy to be worth as much as a quadratic. Vindex proves it very neatly by pointing out that a yard of walk measured along the middle represents a square yard of garden. Whether we consider the straight stretches of walk or the square yards at the angles in which the middle line goes half a yard in one direction and then turns a right angle and goes half a yard in another direction. Class list. First, Vindex. Second, Alumnus Etone. Old King Cole. Third, Dynamite, Janet, Magpie, Taffy. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 20. Answers to Not 10. Paragraph 1. The Chelsea Pensioners. Problem. If 70% have lost an eye, 75% an ear, 80% an arm, 85% a leg, what percentage, at least, must have lost all four? Answer. 10. Solution. I adopt that of polar star as being better than my own. Adding the wounds together, we get 70 plus 75 plus 80 plus 85 equals 310 among 100 men, which gives 3 to each and 4 to 10 men. Therefore, the least percentage is 10. 19 answers have been received. One is five, but as no working is given with it, it must, in accordance with the rule, remain a deed without a name. Janet makes it thirty-five and two-tenths. I am sorry she has misunderstood the question and has supposed that those who had lost an ear were seventy-five percent of those who had lost an eye, and so on. Of course, on this supposition, the percentages must all be multiplied together. This she has done correctly, but I can give her no honours, as I do not think the question will fairly bear her interpretation. Three score and ten makes it nineteen and two eighths. Her solution has given me, I will not say many anxious days and sleepless nights, for I wish to be strictly truthful, but 
some trouble in making any sense at all of it. She makes the number of pensioners wounded once to be 310 percent, I suppose. Dividing by four, she gets 77 and a half as average percentage. Again dividing by four, she gets 19 and two eighths as percentage wounded four times. Does she suppose wounds of different kinds to absorb each other, so to speak? Then, no doubt, the data are equivalent to 77 pensioners with one wound each and a half pensioner with a half wound. And does she then suppose these concentrated wounds to be transferable so that two-fourths of these unfortunates can obtain perfect health by handing over their wounds to the remaining one-fourth? Granting these suppositions, her answer is right, or rather, if the question had been, a road is covered with one inch of gravel along 77.5% of it. How much of it could be covered four inches deep with the same material? Her answer would have been right. But, alas, that wasn't the question. Delta makes the most amazing assumptions. Let everyone who has not lost an eye have lost an ear. Let everyone who has not lost both eyes and ears have lost an arm. Her ideas of a battlefield are grim indeed. Fancy a warrior who would continue fighting after losing both eyes, both ears and both arms. This is a case which she, or it, evidently considers possible. Next come eight writers who have made the unwarrantable assumption that, because 70% have lost an eye, therefore 30% have not lost one, so that they have both eyes. This is illogical. If you give me a bag containing 100 sovereigns, and if in an hour I come to you, my face not beaming with gratitude nearly so much as when I receive the bag, to say, I am sorry to tell you that 70 of these sovereigns are bad. Do I thereby guarantee the other 30 to be good? Perhaps I have not tested them yet. The signs of this illogical octagon are as follows in alphabetical order. Algernon Bray, Dynamite, G.S.C., Jane E., J.D.W., Magpie, who makes the delightful remark, therefore 90% have two of something, recalling to one's memory that fortunate monarch with whom Xerxes was so much pleased that he gave him ten of everything. SSG and Tokyo. Bradshaw of the future and TR do the question in a piecemeal fashion, on the principle that the 70% and the 75%, though commenced at opposite ends of the 100, must overlap by at least 45%, and so on. This is quite correct working, but not, I think, quite the best way of doing it. The other five competitors will, I hope, feel themselves sufficiently glorified by being placed in the first class, without my composing a triumphal ode for each. Class list. First. Old Cat. Old Hen. Polar Star. Simple Susan. White Sugar. Second. Bradshaw of the Future. T.R. Third. Algernon Bray. Dynamite. G.S.C. Jane E. J.D.W. Magpie. S.S.G. Tokyo. Paragraph 2. Change of Day. I must postpone sine die the geographical problem, partly because I have not yet received the statistics I am hoping for, and partly because I am myself so entirely puzzled by it, and when an examiner is himself dimly hovering between a second class and a third, how is he to decide the position of others? Paragraph 3. The Sun's Ages. Problem. At first, two of the ages are together equal to the third. A few years afterwards, two of them are together double of the third. When the number of years since the first occasion is two-thirds of the sum of the ages on that occasion, one age is twenty-one. What are the other two? Answer. Fifteen and eighteen. Solution. Let the ages at first be x, y, the quantity x plus y. Now, if a plus b equals 2c, then the quantity a minus n plus the quantity b minus n 
equals two times the quantity c minus n whatever be the value of n hence the second relationship if ever true was always true hence it was true at first but it cannot be true that x and y are together double of the quantity x plus y hence it must be true of the quantity x plus y together with x or y and it does not matter which we take we assume then the quantity x plus y plus x equals two y that is y equals two x hence the three ages were at first x two x three x and the number of years since that time is two thirds of six x that is is four x hence the present ages are five x six x seven x the ages are clearly integers since this is only the year when one of my sons comes of age hence seven x equals twenty one x equals three and the other ages are fifteen eighteen eighteen answers have been received one of the writers merely asserts that the first occasion was twelve years ago that the ages were then nine six and three and that on the second occasion they were fourteen eleven and eight as a roman father i ought to withhold the name of the rash writer but respect for age makes me break the rule it is three score and ten jane e also asserts that the ages at first were nine six three then she calculates the present ages leaving the second occasion unnoticed old hen is nearly as bad she tried various numbers till i found one that fitted all the conditions but merely scratching up the earth and pecking about is not the way to solve a problem o oh venerable bird and close after old hen prowls with hungry eyes old cat who calmly assumes to begin with that the son who comes of age is the eldest eat your bird puss for you will get nothing from me there are yet two zeros to dispose of minerva assumes that on every occasion a son comes of age and that it is only such a son who is tipped with gold is it wise thus to interpret now my boys calculate your ages and you shall have the money bradshaw of the future says let the ages at first be nine six three then assumes that the second occasion was six years afterwards and on these baseless assumptions brings out the right answers guide future travellers and thou wilt thou art no bradshaw for this age of those who win honours the merely honourable are two dynamite ascertains rightly the relationship between the three ages at first but then assumes one of them to be six thus making the rest of her solution tentative m f c does the algebra all right up to the conclusion that the present ages are five z six z and seven z it then assumes without giving any reason that seven z equals twenty one of the more honourable delta attempts a novelty to discover which son comes of age by elimination it assumes successively that it is the middle one and that it is the youngest and in each case it apparently brings out an absurdity still as the proof contains the following bit of algebra sixty three equals seven x plus four y therefore twenty one equals x plus four sevenths of y i trust it will admit that its proof is not quite conclusive the rest of its work is good magpie betrays the deplorable tendency of her tribe to appropriate any stray conclusion she comes across without having any strict logical right to it assuming a b c as the ages at first and d as the number of the years that have elapsed since then she finds rightly the three equations 2a equals b c equals b plus a d equals 2b she then says supposing that a equals 1 then b equals 2 c equals 3 and d equals 4 therefore for a b c d four numbers are wanted which shall be to each other as 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 it is in the therefore that i detect the unconscientiousness of this bird the conclusion is true but this is only because the equations are homogeneous 
that is, having one unknown in each term, a fact which I strongly suspect had not been grasped, I beg pardon, clawed, by her. Were I to lay this little pitfall, a plus 1 equals b, b plus 1 equals c, supposing a equals 1, then b equals 2, and c equals 3. Therefore, for a, b, c, three numbers are wanted, which shall be to one another as 1 to 2 to 3. Would you not flutter down into it, O magpie, as amiable as a dove? Simple Susan is anything but simple to me. After ascertaining that the three ages at first are as three to two to one, she says, then as two-thirds of their sum added to one of them equals twenty-one, the sum cannot exceed thirty, and consequently the highest cannot exceed fifteen. I suppose her mental argument is something like this. Two-thirds of sum plus one age equals twenty-one. Therefore, sum plus three halves of one age equals thirty one and a half but three halves of one age cannot be less than one and a half here i perceive that simple susan would on no account present a guinea to a newborn baby hence the sum cannot exceed thirty this is ingenious but her proof after that is as she candidly admits clumsy and roundabout she finds that there are five possible sets of ages, and eliminates four of them. Suppose that, instead of five, there had been five million possible sets. Would simple Susan have courageously ordered in the necessary gallon of ink and ream of paper? The solution sent in by C.R. is, like that of simple Susan, partly tentative, and so does not rise higher than being clumsily right. Among those who have earned the highest honours, Algernon Bray solves the problem quite correctly, but adds that there is nothing to exclude the supposition that all the ages were fractional. This would make the number of answers infinite. Let me meekly protest that I never intended my readers to devote the rest of their lives to writing out answers. E. M. Ricks points out that, if fractional ages be admissible, any one of the three sons might be the one come of age, but she rightly rejects this supposition on the ground that it would make the problem indeterminate. White Sugar is the only one who has detected an oversight of mine. I had forgotten the possibility, which of course ought to be allowed for, that the son, who came of age that year, need not have done so by that day, so that he might be only twenty. This gives a second solution, that is, 20, 24, 28. Well said, pure crystal. Verily, thy fair discourse hath been as sugar. Class list. First, Algernon Bray, an old fogey, E. M. Ricks, G. S. C., S. S. G., Tokyo, T. R., White Sugar. Second, C. R., Delta, Magpie, Simple Susan. Third, Dynamite, MFC. I have received more than one remonstrance on my assertion in the Chelsea pensioners' problem that it was illogical to assume from the datum 70% have lost an eye that 30% have not. Algernon Bray states, as a parallel case, suppose Tommy's father gives him four apples and he eats one of them, how many has he left? And says, I think we are justified in answering three. I think so too. There is no must here, and the data are evidently meant to fix the answer exactly. But if the question were set me, how many must he have left, I should understand the data to be that his father gave him four at least, but may have given him more. I take this opportunity of thanking those who have sent, along with their answers to the tenth knot, regrets that there are no more knots to come, or petitions that I should recall my resolution to bring them to an end. I am most grateful for their kind words, but I think it wisest to end what, at best, was but a lame attempt. The stretched meter of an antique song is beyond my compass, and my puppets were neither distinctly in my life like those I now address, nor yet, like Alice and the Mock Turtle, distinctly out of it. 
Yet let me at least fancy, as I lay down the pen, that I carry with me into my silent life, dear reader, a farewell smile from your unseen face, and a kindly farewell pressure from your unfelt hand. And so, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow, that I shall say good night, till it be morrow. End of chapter 20 End of A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Thanks for listening.